our mission president was moving. Um, it was his last transfer, so they're moving from the Geneva, from Geneva to Lyon, and shipping back all of their things. And so it's a little bit more rough than it normally is. So we arrived in Lyon around like I want to say like 12 o'clock or something, and the assistants and the mission president and his wife met us at the gate and took all of our stuff and took us to the office and so we had not slept at all <laughs> so we got to the office and he sat us down at a table and um kind of just like told us a little bit about the mission and handed us out like these um binders with our names on it with a bunch of different talks that are really essential for for studying and just for the mission and so he's telling us all of these things but none of us had gotten any sleep and it was about like three in the afternoon in France so over 24 hours of no sleep all of us were just like we were so drowsy and there is a couple of the elders from the my district in front of me and stuff in this round table and they're just like completely falling asleep and the mission president like taps one on the shoulder and he's just like yeah <laughs> like it was and I was just like I had a fit of giggles it was really embarrassing and I just like couldn't stop and then um our mission president pulled each one of us aside and interviewed us and um took us to dinner and then we went back to our the hotel and stayed there and after that the next day we um, got together, had brunch, and then we were given our companions. My first area was Po. It is about two hours south of Bordeaux, which was our zone at the time. So Bordeaux is in the west, southwest of France. Po is about, I want to say like 45 minutes away from Spain. I think my first week was like, was all right. My first week, I was like, you know, I know the language is going to be hard. I'm not going to understand all of it. It's going to take a little while. I was very patient with myself the first week, surprisingly enough. I think it was the second week that it kind of hit me that I was like, why am I not understanding everything? Like, why can't I contact someone? Why can't, you know, just all these questions. Um, and yeah, that was hard. And my trainer is not... It's not American. She's from Switzerland, Italian speaking, and so she she struggled a little bit. She told me later with like having like trying to help me because she doesn't she didn't speak English very well, or she didn't think she spoke English very well, and so she didn't like want to open her mouth very much. But we overcame that obstacle. <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't that homesick. I I missed my family. But I heard from them, heard from them every week, and I had already lived away from home for what two plus years. So I I knew what it was like to not have your family around you, and I had already mentally prepared myself to not be around my family for eighteen months. So I think when I did get homesick, it was around the holidays. So. I don't know, but I think I think the best thing to do in those moments is to just um, serve others because you forget about yourself and you got to remember why you're here and who you're trying to trying to help. I think the big difference between American food and French food generally is that the French like to use a lot of natural natural food in order to make their food. Um, they use the very basics. And, of course, they have grocery stores and they have different mixes to make things and stuff. But I think a lot of the time they're much more simple than Americans are um, when it comes to making their own food. Um, they, they have places, they have McDonald's, they have um, places that are like McDonald's in France that teenagers go to and everything. But they also have a lot of um, boulangeries, like bakeries and stuff that they make sandwiches and people go there and buy their sandwiches that are like freshly baked, freshly made. Um, that's one thing that I really miss uh, about being 
back in America is I don't have a lot of fresh food. The bread was really, really good. I've never had bread that good, and I haven't had bread that good since I've been there. Um, I don't even know how to describe it, and bread being regular bread, and then like pastries, the pâtisseries, and oh goodness, I don't even, it's so good. I don't even know how to describe it, um, but when I served in Bordeaux, um, one family particularly made us mussels because in Bordeaux they're known for like their seafood and that's one dish that's really um, popular so if you don't like mussels then train yourself to like mussels <laughs> if you're going to the south of France they're really good um, but what else in Po is that's in the Basque region and <clears throat> they have um, this uh, gâteau basque, and it's, um, I don't know how to describe it, it's just like a, it's almost like a pie, but in the inside filling is, I think it's almond or something, like uh, nougat, and, or no, not nougat, it's just like almond paste, and it's in the middle, it's, it's really good, and I, you're not able to find it in other regions, and so when I, left there I was I hadn't realized that and so I was just trying to find it everywhere and I couldn't so if you're ever in the Basque region go there get get the Basque cake um and also the pain au chocolat in the Basque region in Aquitaine like in Bordeaux and Po they call pain au chocolats chocolatines so so if you ask for a pain au chocolat I asked for that once in Poe and they didn't know what I was talking about. Or they just acted like they didn't know what I was talking about and then I was like, chocolatine? And they're like, ah, okay. And they like got me once, so, you know. <laughs> I've had African food. I had um, Algerian food, um, Italian food. So, English food. Like, um, yeah, it just, France has a lot of people from a lot of different regions, so there's there's a lot of French food, but Portuguese, there's a lot of Portuguese people there, and they eat a lot. <laughs> they have a lot of meat in all of their meals, but um, I think that France just has a lot of, a lot of different um, international people, and so you'll, you'll end up eating a lot of different dishes from different countries, not just French. I think my least favorite dish, I can't think of a French dish I didn't really like, but my least favorite dish was an African dish, or <laughs> um, a cow stomach, and um, cooked spinach with fish oil. I think they might have been from the Congo. Um, and they're such nice people very very nice people and that's what makes me feel bad about saying that I just I just couldn't handle their food my trainer actually ended up eating the rest of that for me because I just couldn't French people are I think that French people are really nice I love French people and I think that one misconception is um, that French people are really rude and they're very standoffish, and they won't ever talk to you, um, especially if you're American. And I don't know. I, do, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think that they are standoffish, but I think it's just a different culture that, I don't know, it's like if they don't know somebody, then they're not going to talk to them because they don't know them. So they have a little bit of a wall, but once you, like, you push through that wall, they're really loving and you can stay friends with them for forever because it's just that they commit to being your friend and once they commit, they're really committed. And so I think that that they are one of the most loving people I've ever met. Um, I think it depends on where you are, obviously, but like where I was in Poe, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of French people but mixed with some Spanish and, and Bordeaux, but with Spanish, um, 
like Northern Africans and um, let's see. Yeah, Northern Africans and Spanish people, mainly in that southwestern region of France. And when I was on the east side in Nice and Grenoble, there were um, there were some Swiss, not really, but there there were a good amount of Italians in Nice, and um, good amount of Italians and Arabs, and yeah, as in French. Like, I can't really think of that many other people, groups of people that were living there. Um, I met an Egyptian man in Nice, um, Tunisia. There are people from Tunisia there also. I don't know, the thing about about the French is that they don't focus on, on their work and making a lot of money. They focus on making enough money to, like, spend time with their friends and family. And... I don't know, I think that's something that I really, that's something that I really respect, that they don't focus on their job, they focus on, on their family and the people that they care about. And so that's one of the reasons why I think that, and didn't come up very often in conversation, um, their job and how often they're working and how much money they're making, because that's not something that they care about. Generally, French people believe in themselves. Um, they, they're Catholic, um, but they don't, um, there's a good amount of them that aren't really Catholic. They, they're baptized into the Catholic church, but they don't, they don't practice it at all. And when you start talking to them, you end up like finding out that they don't really believe in anything. And, um... Yeah, it's, it's kind of sad, and I think that they've, I think that that religion played such an important role in their country, that it was something that partially destroyed their country, and so in my mind, I'm, it's kind of like, well, can you blame them for not liking religion, because it was a huge part of, like, lots of death and just bad things that happened in their country, so... You know, obviously religion is important. Obviously, we're missionaries. We're going to teach you about it. But, like, I'm not going to point a finger at you and tell you that you're completely wrong for, like, trying to keep religion out of your life. But, you know, that's why you start teaching them about the gospel because that's something that can that can enrich their life. It can bless them to more than they could ever imagine. You know, most of the time, um, people from Northern Africa are Muslim and they believe in Allah, and they believe in God. And I think that's one thing that, that as, as missionaries, we were really focused on. If you contacted somebody and they're Muslim, it's like, oh, well, I believe in God too, you know? And it's a little bit different, but, you know, you don't wanna, you don't wanna ruffle feathers with them. You're not there to fight, um, you're there for them to, to, to help them feel God's love. And so um, one of the big things that, that we would do is just to, to point out that we both, we both love God and we both like recognize that he's there and to thank them for, for their, um, how important they think, um, what's the word, for like the way that they treat families. They really care about families. That's one of the most important things to them. And so most, you normally can't teach Muslims who are from Northern Africa unless you get permission from the mission president. And so one thing that, you know, to end a contact with somebody who's Muslim, instead of just being like, oh, you're Muslim, okay, bye. <laughs> it can be really, that can be really, really awkward. And you don't want to do that either. So you don't want to make them feel stupid. And so, I don't know, we would end it kind of sometimes just being like, oh, well, like, thank you for for your like for your love for your family and for like loving God so much like that's something that really that means a lot the hardest adjustment for me when I started the mission um as a blue was I think just speaking because I I love to talk and to not be able to say the things you want to say <laughs> it's really hard 
especially if it's something like you want to bear your testimony, you know, and it's like you kind of learn those things. You learn those things in the MTC, but it's different when you're talking to somebody who's fluent and who's just looking at you like, okay, what? Like, come on, you know, like spit it out. And you're just like, I, duh, you know, and you just end up being saved by your trainer. And so I think that was the hardest thing for me was just being able to, to speak when I wanted to speak. The best advice I can give is just to speak. And that sounds so ridiculous, but I don't like one of the things that was that I really wanted to focus on also was getting the accent down because I don't know, I just I you can you can hear the difference. Um and so I had my trainer help me with that a lot. And so during language study we would I would like read things out loud to her and and at first she she would just let me read and I'm like wait what how do you actually pronounce that and she's like oh you're fine and I'm like no no I'm not fine like how do I actually pronounce that and she's like are you sure sister Gardner like do you do you really want me to do that because that's gonna be hard and I was like yes like I can't believe you even asked me that you know <laughs> and so um she started doing that and it was like multiple times in every sentence like she would be fixing what I was saying but it gave me more confidence when I started speaking to people um, outside of the apartment and I think it definitely benefited me and helped me like reach one of my goals. Um, I think that one of the best things to do while in the mission field while you're trying to learn a new language to learn French is to write down the different words that that you hear somebody say and to to write it down and then use it in your language study when you're when you're studying in order to to learn those new words because um, at some points of my mission I would hear things that I didn't know but I would just keep going and then later on I'm like I need to write this down because I've heard this word so many times and so I write it down and then I learn what it is and it really benefited me so um, and I know a lot of other successful missionaries and learning the language they had little notebooks that they'd always keep like the elders keep it in their pocket or something and they'd always just be like writing down words or phrases that that French people use so we celebrated Christmas Noel um, but for the French they celebrate normally around on Christmas Eve they have a big party a huge dinner and um, so Christmas Day isn't as important, I guess. But yeah, you celebrate Christmas. We celebrated Easter. Um, celebrated a lot of Catholic holidays um, that they get the day off from work. And so that's one thing to <laughs> to recognize is that they have a lot of holidays, and <laughs> it's just sometimes to a ridiculous extent like people are always off of work and are always on holiday so they weren't going to be there if you wanted to teach them but let's see so Christmas Easter they didn't Halloween is much less celebrated they did celebrate it but not by the same standards as Americans and Valentine's Day is only for people who are in love it's not for like friends and stuff to celebrate and like for you to give a valentine to like I don't know somebody in the ward is just like you're in love with them so it's like don't do that when you're out there not talking to people in uh, public transportation that was one thing that was really hard for me to adjust to just because you're a missionary so you're not going you're not going to listen to that like you still have to contact people um, especially on buses or trams, <laughs> the people can't get away. So you just, um, and they won't, they won't talk to you. Like nobody talks to each other in those public transportations. They just keep to themselves, but as a missionary, you have to. And so I know one way that I, I tried to play it cool by just like, you know, you sit by them and then just like, you know, how's your day today? And they're like, is good and <laughs> sometimes if they saw your badge then they're just like oh no 
no, no. Like they just they would they would not talk to you. But you know, if they didn't see your badge, sometimes they would just like keep talking to you and um then you just start talking to them and then they're like, Oh, why are you you know, where are you from? And then you tell them and then they're like, Oh, why are you here? Are you just doing a an internship or just studying abroad and like actually, you know, you like have your Book of Mormon and you you know, you contact them and they respect you a lot more for it. Um, than they would have if you just walked up to them and said, like, do you want to learn more about Jesus Christ? Uh, but that's one way that I try to work with public transportation and contacting. Um, that still, I still get anxious just thinking about it <laughs> because that was, that was a rough, that was a rough thing in my mission. Clothing for a sister missionary, I would first off suggest, um, shoes you can buy, you can buy any shoes as long as they're flat. Just get insoles because that's one thing I I bought some like really sturdy sister missionary shoes and I think I wore them like twice, maybe three times, and they were really uncomfortable and they're really heavy and just clunky and people say that they're not gonna look at your feet. They will look at your feet. You're in France. They care about what you look like, and so I I would say just just bring the shoes that you enjoy wearing and get insoles for them so you're not ruining your feet. Um, and it's also just cheaper. You can buy, you don't have to buy really nice shoes. You can just buy normal shoes and put the insoles in. Um, during the winter time, definitely have tights, even like leggings, um, depending on where you are. At one point I was in Grenoble, which is at the foot of the French Alps, and I was there, I think, in March, February, March, and it snowed my first Sunday, like really snowed. And so luckily I had some pantyhose and stuff, but I just come from Nice, so I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. But just to remember to bring, for the winter time, really thick, thick pantyhose, um, make sure to have a pair of boots and hat, gloves, you know, that kind of stuff. For the summertime, I would suggest like white shirts or just like airy shirts um, so you don't get super hot, less thick of fabrics like cotton or um, you know, polyester or something. And yeah, the nicer shirts, they're... <sighs> Don't spend a lot of money on nice shirts or nice skirts. I think you can bring some, bring a few for um, conferences and stuff, but don't have that just as like everything you have, nice things, because sometimes you will, you'll rip a skirt or you'll like stain your shirt and you don't want to do that to something that you really like. And your shoes will be destroyed by the end of your mission. So that's another, you know, Bring good shoes, or bring shoes that you enjoy wearing, but they are not afraid to have to throw away eventually. And also just wear cute clothes, you know? Don't, don't think that you need to be a standard missionary because um, you're in France and people, not that it's like the most important thing, but people really do look at your appearance. And so just make sure that you, you look presentable. Um, and in France, they also don't wear super bright clothes all the time. If they do, it's just like one article of clothing or like a scarf or something. It's never like, you know, like a bright red blouse with like a yellow skirt and I don't know, some crazy colored shoes. Like they will look at you weird. And so I would suggest s subtle colors, but wearing like nicer, nicer things. Crime and safety, um, I don't think that they have sister missionaries in Marseille anymore, but that is a dangerous city. And just because there's a lot of um, Arabs, they, <laughs> like a nickname for the city by French people also is Little Algeria. And so it's just a, a city that has a lot of people who aren't originally from France and who may have a lower opinion of women and so sisters would have to go in um 
the times for like, it was eight o'clock that had to be in by eight o'clock and then changed to seven o'clock. And, um, so now I think they just, they took sisters out altogether, but, um, cities like Marseille, you have to just be really precautious, um, about like where you are. Um, although you have the spirit with you, you also have your own common sense. And so you have to just be watching around your shoulder, like looking over your shoulder every once in a while. Um, we had a time when I was in Grenoble, the foot of the Alps, and we were grocery shopping, my companion and I, and on P day. And I don't know, for some reason I noticed this guy, um, like he kept on, he was on in the same aisle as us. Like we'd move to one aisle and then he would show up and then we'd go to another aisle and then a little bit later he'd show up again. And at first I thought it was like, I was like, that's kind of weird. And I was like, well, maybe he's just, maybe he's just randomly going in the same aisle as us, you know, who knows? And, um, then I like would watch him and he hadn't picked up he didn't pick up anything. Like he'd pick it up and then put it back down. He wasn't holding anything though. And I'm like, okay, this guy is sketchy. And um, come to find out he had been following us. And so when we were leaving the grocery store, he came out also, but like a good distance away like from us. So we wouldn't notice, but because <laughs> I don't know, I guess I was really observant that day or something, but um, Heavenly Father definitely helped out. But I, I had told my companion that he had been following us and she's just like, really? She's like, I hadn't noticed at all. And when he was following us again, I just, <laughs> I had turned around and he had been crossing the street right after we had, and he was probably about 20 feet away from us. And I turned around and I looked at him and he like looked at me, but then he looked away really fast. And I just like, I glared at him. <laughs> I like stared him down and this guy like looked back at me and we just like made this eye contact for like five like five seconds ten seconds maybe but like it felt like longer and I'm just like glaring at this guy <laughs> and he's just like he like finally just like stopped he just like looked down and then he just like went the other way and we like circled the block um before we went back to our apartment and like you know, kept checking over our shoulders and stuff and he had left, but you know, definitely like be observant of where you are and who's around you. And in moments like that, after, afterward, call the mission president and just let him know that something happened and that you're safe, that you're okay. But just to let him know that in case other sisters move into the new apartment, that there's a creepy guy, <laughs> you know, but yeah. We had a family that their children weren't baptized. Or, well, it was a mother and she had six children. And she was single and she had been baptized, I think, five years before then or something, five, three, five years. And her children hadn't been baptized, though, because the fathers wouldn't, they weren't going to let them be baptized. And so then she kind of had like a little bit of a, like, oh, the fathers, I think they'll let, they'll let them. So we started teaching them lessons because um, she had, a, I think, three or four of them that were over the age of eight. And so we started teaching them. And then one Sunday, um, this sister, she had brought a friend to church that was a guy that she had met at this, like, big fete de Bayonne, which is, like, this this crazy party that they have in the city of Bayonne. And, um, and she had met him and I guess they kind of hit it off, but he wasn't a member of the church. And so she brought him to church and he shows up at the gospel principles class, the investigators class. And, um, <laughs> and he had, he was wearing like a suit and like nice clothes. And so we thought that he was already a member of the church. And so after, after the class, we, like approached him and we're just like, Oh, hi. Like, so where are you from? And he's like, well, actually like I live in Bordeaux, but I'm, I'm down here like visiting like on the weekends and we're like, Oh, so do you go to the ward up there? And he's just like, no, like I'm not a member of the church. And we're like, Oh, so are you an investigator to one of the missionaries up there? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm not. And we're like, have you ever been to church before? And he's like, this is my first Sunday. And we're like, what? Because during the class, he had been 
um, I don't even remember what you're talking, what you're talking about, but he was just like, he was agreeing with the teacher and like saying comments and the teacher was agreeing with them, like with him. And it was just, it was really weird and in a good way, but we're just like, you've never been taught before. Like, would you like, we're going to be going over to your, to your friend, girlfriend's like house this evening. Like, can we, can we teach you also? And he's just like, yeah, sure. So I went over and, um, we we're just teaching the kids and he was there. And then after that lesson, we asked him if we could, if we could teach him separately, like individually the lessons. And he was like, yeah, okay, sure. Why not? Um, <laughs> he was just like, why not? Like, maybe I'll, I'll be baptized in like a month. Maybe I'll be baptized in like a year. Like, who knows? Maybe I won't be baptized. Like, we'll just see what happens. And we're like, you just said that? Like, because normally you don't, you don't talk that much about baptism. Like you should, but it was just, anyway. So we were talking to him and he was, um, he was totally down for us teaching him. So the next Sunday we taught him and we'd asked him to read the Book of Mormon and he had told us that he hadn't read it and he, or he had read it, but he hadn't prayed about it. And we asked him why he hadn't prayed about it. And very sincerely, he just said like, you know, like heavenly father, like God has given me so much in my life right now. Like I feel so blessed. Like he's brought Josie, the, the member, he's brought Josie into my life. And like, I have a good job and like, I just don't, I don't want to pressure God to, to give me more right now because like, I, I just don't want to do that. I don't think it's fair to him. And it was just like, it was such a sweet response. And we we're just like, you know, Alex, like we, we love you. And we know that like heavenly father loves you so much. And the thing, the thing is he wants you to pray about the book of Mormon. Like he wants to bless you. And so like, we don't want you to hold that back. Like he wants to give you these blessings and Josie is just another part of that. And then we, we just discussed this with him and he was like, yeah, okay. Like maybe I'll pray about it. And, um, and we we're just like, you know, Alex, we promise you that if you don't pray about the Book of Mormon, you will never receive a, you will never receive an answer. Like you will not, you'll, you will not know if it's true or not, and you won't be able to progress with it. And, and I think that that seemed to, to make an impact on him. And we asked him if he'd read it and pray about it again. And he was just like, um, yeah, okay, maybe, like, maybe I'll do it. We still didn't have, like, a solid commitment with him and it kind of bothered us by the end of it, but we are like, okay, like, we can't say anything else. We've already said everything we could have. So we left, and then the next Sunday, we were talking to our, to, to Josie, and she told us that he, um, he was sleeping on their couch, like, over the weekend or something, and he'd come into, into her room and woke her up, and he was just like, Josie, like, I, I did it. I did what the sister missionaries told me. Like, I prayed about the Book of Mormon. And he's like, I want to be baptized. And so the next time we taught him, um, he, he was like, so I was talking to the bishop today at church about getting baptized. And he said, I need to talk to the missionaries. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. And um, he ended up getting baptized about a month later. And I visited their family right before um, I went home and they're getting married like a few weeks after that. I was barely missing the marriage. Um, they're getting married a few weeks after that and um, they're moving into like this house, like all of them together and they're planning on going to the temple and getting sealed. And it was just an incredible experience seeing, um, seeing how willing he was to change. And he is a Frenchman. And just how, like, you can't stereotype people and put them into, like, into groups, you know. French people will not accept the gospel. And, like, you're only going to baptize Africans in France. Um, I don't think that's true at all. I think that the reason why you're called to France is to, to convert the French. Also the Africans, you know, whoever is there that will listen to you. But I think that those people are prepared. There are some of them that are really prepared for the gospel. And, um... 
they're just ready to hear it. I remember flying. It was a long flight. Yeah. I remember landing, finally, you know, meeting up with the other missionaries in my group and, and landing. Uh, and I remember meeting President Roney for the first time. That's my mission president. And he's a tall dude. Tall dude, huge hands. You know, his wife is just the sweetest lady ever, Sister Roni. And he gave me a hug, told me welcome to the mission and such. And I was pretty jet lagged. You know, I had no idea really what was going on. All I wanted to do was go to sleep. Um, but that that was a good first experience was meeting President Roni. You know, just feeling how warm hearted he was and such. And I remember eating my first breakfast there. It was a nice croissant. You know, and a nice yogurt and some cheese. And that was very French. And I, I remember thinking, I like this. I can, I can put up with this. You know, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have fun these two years. And then I remember meeting my trainer for the first time, Elder Stanford, who I think you've already interviewed. Actually, um, super awesome dude. I'm glad I had him as my trainer. Um, I, it was meant for me. I think so. Everything was difficult. <laughs> I spoke French already. I was already fluent in French, so that was no problem. But getting used to the way of life, I guess getting used to the schedule, getting used to running around all the time, uh, that, that was a little bit hard. And then getting used to getting out of my comfort zone and talking to people I didn't know about something that they didn't really want to talk about sometimes was, was difficult as well. You know, approaching that person and telling them you're a missionary and that you want to talk about the gospel with them, it takes a little getting used to. Really, um, so the, pretty much everything was hard for the first year and, and three fourths. <laughs> so, the church is in France. It's definitely growing. It's not very big right now, but um, it's there and it's growing. And it's I mean we have a temple there now in Paris, which was awesome. Um, my mission, the Lyon mission, is the entire south of France. And it goes up a little bit north. We have Dijon, is about the northernmost point of our mission. Um, we, we have the Mediterranean coast, which is beautiful. It's really hot, though. And then we have about half of Switzerland, you know, the Francophone part of Switzerland. I served in Bordeaux, which is on the uh, west coast of France. Uh, I served in Toulouse, which is kind of down right above the Spanish border, right above the Pyrenees Mountains. And I served in Perigueux, which is kind of between the two, actually, just right smack dab in the middle. And then my last city was in Switzerland, in Yverdon, Switzerland. And that was nestled right in the middle of all the Alps and such. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, in Bordeaux, there's three different wards. Uh, there's the Azine ward, there's the... Oh, what other wards are there? I can't remember, but I served in the Azine ward. And on average, we had about 110... 120 members that came every Sunday. So it was a good size ward. Uh, and then in Toulouse, there's also a couple different wards. Um, I served in Capitole. And there's on average about 150 to 180 people that come, you know, every Sunday. Uh, and then Perigueux was a branch. Um, it, was a, it was the smallest city I served in, actually. It was a little village. And on average about 20, you know, 15 to 40 people would come on Sundays, depended on the Sunday, you know, depended on the day. But, and then in Switzerland, it was also a branch, but it was a bigger branch. It was about 60 to 80 members that would come every Sunday. Um, as for the religious background, well, it's kind of a taboo subject in France, really. You know, religion, French people don't really like it much. The general perspective on religion in France is that it's only ever caused grief and heartache and death. <laughs> You know, which I don't blame them. Their history is, is full of, uh, oh well, yeah, they had the Hundred Year War, Protestants versus the Catholics, um, the Crusades. You know, they, they even had Crusades on, they even crusaded their own cities every once in a while. You know, look up the Albigensian Crusade. And uh, their history just, you know, the Catholic Church in France isn't very well looked upon and they kind of associate the catholic church to all religion and they're they have a really negative outlook on all religion as a result so most of them are catholic by tradition you know but don't go to church or they're atheists or they're just or they just don't care you know but they're more than willing to talk to you about you know 
really anything and everything. They they love talking, you know, about anything and everything. They they'll talk your head off. So yeah. almost everybody in France smokes. So that's always uh, an interesting topic to. Uh, the word of wisdom is always really interesting to talk about because it usually involves helping your investigator getting over their cigarette addiction or getting rid of the wine because wine is a huge part of France as well. That's kind of the make it or break it for the investigators is if they're willing to give that up then they have the beginnings of a testimony and you need to continue with that investigator. There's a lot of rumors that fly around about our church. Um, they, they sometimes think that FLDS are the Mormons and such, so they, they think we're all polygamists and that we're a cult in France and such. So you got to get over that because you're going to get that all the time in France. You know, yeah. Oh, I have heard of the Mormons. They're, they're a cult. They're a sect. You know, uh, Are they here in France? <laughs> they're polygamists, right? And you'll, you'll hear that a lot. And you'll get used to clarifying those issues and such. And I always like doing that because it... I, don't know, I felt like it was giving a positive image to the church and making the French people know that we're not terrible people who uh, we're not a cult, we're not a sect. And I always liked when I had the opportunity to clarify that. The French people always had a hard time with believing that there was a latter day prophet, a modern day prophet, who receives revelation for the whole church. Um, they kind of don't like trusting people like that, you know, the, the common question that I was uh, I would always get asked was well how how can you trust that dude you know how how can you be sure that he won't lead you off into I don't know like just doing just how do you know you're not being taken advantage of by this guy um and that was always a good opportunity to talk about the book of mormon which they've never heard of a lot of times you know and that's another hard concept for them to grasp as well as uh, is another book, an additional book, you know, another testament of Jesus Christ. But it's it's always fun when you when you have the opportunity to talk about the Book of Mormon in a contact or in a lesson, because it's the first time they've heard of it usually. And if not, then it's it's a great time to elaborate on it and to talk about it and to tell them how great it is and how they should read it. I served from Let's see, I got into the MTC May, 25th, May 2013. I got back uh, May 2015, not too long ago, about five and a half months ago. The Lyon mission is definitely different from the Paris mission. It's, um, I think the mission is bigger. Our mission is bigger, but the cities in the Paris mission tend to be bigger. You know? French food is probably the best food I've ever had in my life, ever. I miss it so much. Um, I would love going over to the members' houses to eat dinner because they they knew how to cook really really well. Freezer food doesn't really exist, you know. Ready to eat food doesn't really exist in France. They take the time to prepare their own food, and it's a lot more healthy than the food that we eat here. Um, the French are very concerned with what they call bio, which is I guess for us that would be organic food, and it's become such a big deal now that organic food is actually somewhat cheaper to buy because everybody buys it now. You know, everybody goes for it. Whereas the organic food here, for example, in America, it's really expensive because, you know, who buys organic food? N nobody really buys organic food here. We should, but not a lot of people do. So they they always took the time to prepare their own food, their own dinners, their own everything. And um, so good. You'd start out, typical dinner, you'd start out with probably a salad or something like that, something light. And then the main course would be it, it depended really on the family and on, on the background of the family, but some sort of meat, you know, either chicken or, or pork or, or beef with uh, some sort of rice, maybe some potatoes. Yeah, it, it, it depends. There's such a huge variety of, of food in France and such a huge variety of dishes. That would be followed up by a wonderful dessert of some sort, usually something cold or yogurt or uh, it was all really healthy. I've, I've never eaten healthier, I think, than, than when I was in France. Uh, in Switzerland, there's a lot more potatoes, I noticed. We ate a lot more tartiflette, is what we called it, tartiflette, which is this potato dish. It's just a bunch of potatoes with some, what we, I guess the equivalent here would be bacon bits, really, lardons, lardons with tartiflette cheese on top. 
and just put that in the oven for a good hour and then take it back out and eat that. It's wonderful. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Other than that, I didn't notice a whole lot of differences really between the French food and the Swiss food. Um, the cheeses were different. There's different cheeses in Switzerland than in France. You get a lot more tom, a lot more mountain cheeses in Switzerland than in France. Um, then there's the famous Swiss cheese, which tastes nothing like the Swiss cheese we find in America. It's actually entirely different. It's entirely different. The texture is entirely different. When you think Swiss cheese, you think that holy cheese, and it's kind of more more solid, you know. But it's it's not that way, and it doesn't even taste. Uh, anything alike, really. You, you have to go to Switzerland and, and taste the Swiss cheese, the real Swiss cheese. It's fantastic. Confit de canal is my favorite. It's slow-cooked duck um, with potatoes, and it's the best thing ever, especially in a sandwich. Uh, in France, oh yeah, I can't forget this, uh, a lot of kebabs. There'd be a lot of kebaberies, is what they were called. And what that is, is uh, it was, it's kind of our equivalent of fast food, really. When, when us missionaries wanted something ch cheap and quick and easy to eat, we'd go to a kebab ring and get us a five-year kebab. And with that, you get fries and a little 32 centiliter drink. I think it's lamb. That's, that's what I've been told, is it's lamb. And it's put in a bun, sort of. It's put in the bun. You get vegetables and some salad, some tomatoes. And then my favorite sauce to put in was Algerian sauce. That was the best sauce in my opinion. That's the more Middle Eastern influence in France that the kebabs came from that and I'm glad they did because I like kebabs. So in Switzerland you didn't really get as many kebaberies. There's not as much um, Middle Eastern influence in Switzerland at all. So but there's a wonderful variety, more so more of a variety in France really than in Switzerland. In Switzerland you get a lot of the traditional uh, dishes and, and, and cooking. I didn't have the opportunity really to eat too many traditional Swiss dishes, so I couldn't I couldn't yeah. really say anything on that. In France, my favorite drink was Orangina. It's you find it here in America, but it's not the same. It's an orange drink, fizzy, um, and it's got pulp in it, and it's it's wonderful. It's just a really good lemon orange kind of drink. Um, in Switzerland, there was this drink. It was. I can't remember what it was called anymore, but it was a grapefruit flavored drink, and that was my favorite drink in Switzerland. Um, definitely a lot of wine, which we never got to drink. <laughs> um, and the grape juice in France is the best grape juice that I've ever tasted, ever. Here we have Welch's, but it's, uh, in my opinion, it's got kind of a chemical taste to it. But in France, it's it's, wonderful sublime my favorite drink you eat that you eat cheese and then take a swig of grape juice after that and it, i can see why the french people like wine you know we'll put it that way because it really brings out the flavor of the cheese it's, it's really interesting serving a chinese speaking mission in a non-chinese country i guess uh, chinese speaking in france isn't very common i guess the largest number of missionaries that were chinese speaking in france in our mission, when I was there, five, five of us at the most, and then the, the least number of us there ever was, was three. So, uh, we definitely weren't common, and because of that, we always served in specific areas. The university cities were where you would find the most Chinese people. So, Bordeaux, Toulouse, Lyon, uh, probably Marseille, Nice, you know, all the big French cities that have universities, you, you'll probably find some Chinese students. Uh, and they come mostly to study business, economics, management. Uh, in Bordeaux, they come to study the wine trade. Uh, in Toulouse, they also go to study um, aeronautical engineering because Airbus's headquarters are in Toulouse. So we meet a lot of aeronautical engineers and a lot of business students and such in, in all of France, really, in Bordeaux and Toulouse and, and all the big cities. Uh, I only ever served in Bordeaux and Toulouse where there were Chinese people. So, and it was, it was really different. You could find them, they were definitely there, but there weren't a whole lot of them, so you'd have to go look for them in, in specific parts of town, mostly around the universities. We had a really special way of contacting them and talking to them. They, they're just the most kind, most humble people ever. I love talking to the Chinese people in France. They're, they, they always made my day somehow. 
you know, it, despite the fact that I couldn't really speak the language very well, um, they were very understanding and they would always help you out, you know, anytime. You ask them a question about Chinese and they would answer it for you. Um, and they were a lot more willing to talk to you about religion and such than the French people were. So we, we had a questionnaire, actually, that got introduced into the mission about at my halfway point. And it was geared mostly towards French people. You know, the first question was something like, do you think there are a lot of problems in the world today? Uh, uh, do you think it would be important to have God's help with these problems? If God sent a representative or something to earth, what do you think this representative would say, you know, uh, for God and such? And, and then you would, you would go into the Book of Mormon and a prophet and such and such and such. But that's because the French people already had kind of a Christian background. With the Chinese people, though, most of them didn't have Christian backgrounds. So we kind of changed the questionnaire as Chinese missionaries did. We changed it to, where are you from in China, you know? What is the most famous thing in your city or in your province? Or, you know, what, what is your favorite Chinese food? Uh, do you like it here in France? What's your favorite food here in France? What's, what's, the favorite, what's your favorite thing that you've seen here so far that you've done here? Uh, what are you studying? What's your major? What do you want to do with that someday? Uh, you really wanted to identify with them, uh, get them comfortable with you and such before you brought up religion. Um, and then you, as soon as you got them comfortable, you'd kind of smoothly transition into religion. Like, yeah, do you have any religious beliefs? Uh, what do you believe? You know, and, and sometimes they'd say, well, I'm Buddhist, you know, uh, or I'm Taoist, or I, I don't believe in God. You know, that's just how China is, and such. And then you had the opportunity to teach a principle or something like that. Set up an appointment, get their contact information, uh, it depended on how the conversation went. But <laughs> learning Chinese really was the hard part. It wasn't really talking with people. It was just learning it because I, I wasn't immersed in the language. Uh, I was definitely immersed in the French language, but I spent about an hour every day, uh, as often as I could, doing language study, Chinese study, and that was a really important, important part of my day. And if that part of my day didn't go well, then the rest of my day wasn't going to go well either. Because at about the halfway point of my mission, uh, my mission president put me into the Chinese assignment full time. I had started in it at the beginning of my mission for the first three transfers or so, and then I got put into French work for a while. And then about my year mark, I got put back into the Chinese work, and I didn't leave until I went to Switzerland near the end of my mission. And uh, our instructions from President Roney were to contact only Chinese people. Don't worry about the French people. You know, the French missionaries will get them. But your job is specifically to go out and find the Chinese people. So we had to be strategic. We had to go contacting a lot around the universities um, and avoid the university authorities because they didn't like us being there <laughs> at all. Um, and anytime we saw a Chinese person, we, we went straight for that person. Uh, it was kind of like fishing, really, and that's what one of my companions would call it, was we would go Chinese fishing, sort of. And having that questionnaire really helped out a lot as well. If you're a Chinese-speaking missionary going to France, uh, don't worry about it. You know, you might think that you're not going to learn a lot of Chinese while you're there, but you will. You definitely will. Um, make sure that your language study is a priority. Definitely make sure that your language study is a priority and make sure that you have the spirit while you're doing your language studies. Because if you don't, you're not going to learn anything uh, and you're not going to remember much of what you learned and you're not going to absorb a lot of what you hear from native Chinese speakers as well. Take as many opportunities as you can to be around Chinese people. We set up a game night uh, for our Chinese investigators and just for our Chinese friends as well. You know, if they didn't want to learn about the gospel, that was fine. We were still going to be their friends and, and play games with them and such because who knows, you know, somewhere along the line they might remember us and, and remember how happy we were and how happy we were able to make them feel. And, you know, that might want to make them investigate the church again or for the first time. We also set up an English class, taught English to Chinese investigators, as well as a French class. Uh, we set up both of those. And they were huge successes. And we definitely learned a lot of Chinese just from those experiences because they were fun, they were natural, we were around native speakers, not just with the book, you know. And that's, that's the best way to learn Chinese. There weren't enough 
Chinese investigators or members to make a branch specifically Chinese. So they had to go to church with uh, you know, French in French. And sometimes that would work to our advantage because Chinese investigators would want to come because they were studying French and they wanted to be in an atmosphere where French was being spoken a lot and they wanted to learn more French. Uh, that's what it would start out as sometimes, you know. But um, working on integration between the French members and the Chinese members and or investigators uh, was, was really important. Um, if they weren't getting along or if they weren't understanding each other or being uh, exposed to each other, if they were being kept separate, it was not good at all. We needed them to integrate, to understand each other. Uh, and when that happened, teaching the gospel became so much easier, a lot easier, because then you could bring French members teaching with you, you know, and not just Chinese members, which were, who were usually always studying or something like that, not too available. The lifestyle in France, when you're young, you go to school a lot. High school, the really important thing is the, the baccalauréat. You have to pass that, you have to obtain that, but you have to do a lot of studying to be able to to pass that test to get that and it's it's really important in france you kind of have to know what you want to do in life before you leave high school whereas in america you can kind of decide that when you're in college and going to university in america you can kind of decide or you can kind of put off deciding what you want to do in life uh until even after university and do all your generals and such but in france you got to know what you want to do before you leave high school so that you can go to the right university and to the to a specialized university and so high school studies are really important and kids are you know pretty immersed in their studies but definitely find a lot of time to have fun and goof off yeah then they go to university and specialize in what they want to do uh and that's kind of a party lifestyle <laughs> sort of kind of fridays and saturdays were always really hectic at night <laughs> getting home and such for the most part you you're going to live in an apartment Apartments are way more common in France than, than here where everybody has a house and a car. You know, in France, everybody uh, might have an apartment and they might have a car. A lot of people don't because public transportation is just so well done in France and the cities are so much less spread out than in America that you can basically walk anywhere you want or take the bus anywhere you want or the tram or if it's available, the metro or the subway, whatever you want to call it. The monetary system, they use the euro. In Switzerland, they use the Swiss franc. And in Switzerland, the place I served wasn't too big. It was just a village, really. So the tra public transportation wasn't... Um, we rarely used the public transportation. We always walked everywhere in Switzerland. And the lifestyle in Switzerland is so much more laid back. You know, that's the impression I got, is it's, it's a lot more laid back. The Swiss government definitely treats their citizens pretty well. A lot more taxes in Switzerland though, but the benefits in both France and Switzerland when you get older are excellent. Really, really good. Really, really good. We never really had many problems with crime or anything like that. Uh, in France, probably the most dangerous city is Marseille, down south. Uh, it's a port city. Um, it's famous for being kind of a city of crime and, and missionaries have to be a little more careful when they're serving there. President Rowena usually picked those missionaries, you know, and they were usually bigger. <laughs> no sister missionaries there, so. But that was about the only problem city we ever had. There are two main religions, I would say, in the south of France, and that's Catholicism and Islam. There, there are a lot of Muslims in France, um, and we never really had any problems, actually. A lot of the Muslims that we would meet were really nice people, really respectable. Um, but the young kids that we'd meet, you know, the teenagers and such, uh, both Catholic and Muslim were always pretty uh, teenagery, you know, they, I don't want to say delinquent somewhere, but you know how teenagers get, you know, they, they, they mellow when they get a little bit older and such, but it's about the only problems we'd ever have was, was teenagers making fun of us or occasionally throwing stuff at us and, you know, n no big problems at all, actually. So depending on the region you're in in France, and even in Switzerland, the architecture is different. 
but in France and Switzerland, it's kind of the same. You know, the housing, mostly apartments. You know, the younger you are, the more likely you're going to be in an apartment. It's only when you're older and have a little bit more money that you're going to have a house to yourself. And even then, it's going to be a, a pretty small house, you know. Just what you need. Not, not huge. Gardens are really popular in both Switzerland and France. If you have a garden, it's, it's great. You know, you'll probably grow your own tomatoes, your own vegetables, your own salad and such. And I always loved going to members' houses who grew their own vegetables. They were, it was always really good. Well, the, the architecture is different from region to region. Like I said, in Bordeaux, the stone that they use is different than from what they use in Toulouse, for example. In Toulouse, it's famous for being the, the pink city, literally translated. They use a lot of brick, red brick. So in, in Toulouse, they use a lot of red brick and the architecture is different. You know, buildings are built differently. Um, it's, it's just beautiful. All of the red brick that you see throughout the city and it's even used in some of the cathedrals. One of them is built entirely out of brick and it's, it's beautiful. Whereas in, in Bordeaux, for example, they don't, they don't use brick. They use slabs of, of light colored rock. You know, it's, it's different and their architecture and the way their buildings are built is different as well. You just have to take a walk in downtown Bordeaux and then take a walk in downtown Toulouse and it would be obvious. You could totally see the difference. If you live in the city, your lifestyle is pretty much going to be the same as any other city dweller. Um, but if you live in the country, you're probably going to be more of a farmer or um, cultivator, something like that. And that lifestyle is pretty different. Uh, you definitely do a lot of work with your own hands. Really everything in Europe is expensive. In France, it's pretty expensive. Um, cost of living is definitely higher if you're in the city, I would like to say, than if you're in the country. But if you're in the country as well, you need to consider the fact that, well, I mean, you need a bunch of different supplies. Sometimes you'll have a tractor. You might need fertilizer, different soil. Um, so in all, I couldn't really tell you which was more expensive because I'm not sure of the cost of living in the country, really. But I know that living in the city is expensive. Cost of living, when we had to go buy food, we would usually budget 50 euros a week. And we got a little more than other missions did, just because the cost of living and the cost of food was a little bit higher. But on average, we'd spend 40 to 50 euros a week in groceries, and that's the equivalent of about 60, 65, 70 bucks a week, just on groceries. So, Heavenly Father usually is Père Céleste. Père is Father, and then Céleste is Heavenly, I guess, of the sky. Heavenly. And then you want to thank Him, first off. So, uh, I thank Thee. Je te remercie, or je te suis reconnaissant, pour. So, I'm thankful for, I'm grateful to you for. Uh, and the interesting thing about French is when you, when you pray to Heavenly Father, you don't use the and thou. You use uh, you, I guess. You're a lot less formal because he's your Heavenly Father. And in French, it's just that way. So in French, you either vous vois or you tutoie. And vous voyez is very formal. That's what you use with older people, with your superiors and such. And tutoie is what you use with your friends and your parents and your family. So they use that in prayer because Heavenly Father is, is your father and he's a part of your family. So never vous voir in prayer. So je te suis reconnaissant pour, or je te remercie pour, and then I ask thee to bless me with such and such. Je te demande de me donner or de me bénir avec, you know, and then what, what you need, I suppose. And then to close the prayer, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's au nom de Jésus Christ, amen. I'll do a demo prayer real fast. Um, Père Céleste, merci beaucoup pour cette journée. Thanks for today. Merci pour ma famille. Thanks for my family. Pour mes amis. For my friends. Et uh, merci pour tout ce que tu m'as donné. Thanks for everything that you've given me. Je te demande de m'aider à bien faire, à, à bien étudier dans mes classes. Please help me to study well in my classes. <laughs> Je te demande de bénir ma famille, bless my family, de bénir mes amis, to bless my friends, et de me bénir aussi avec ton esprit, and to bless me with, with thy spirit. 
Uh, au nom de Jésus Christ, amen. In Jesus Christ, amen. So I was with a Chinese companion. His name was Elder Young. He's from Hong Kong. And together we were training our brand new greenie. He was a day old in the mission. And we had gone back to Toulouse. We were in Toulouse at the time. And there were riots going on. And it was pretty, uh, it's, it's normal. Riots are pretty normal. But this was a pretty big riot. And it was later at night. And the riot police had been called out and everything. Um, and we got stuck in downtown when it happened. <laughs> like right smack down in the middle of it. So it, it happened all of a sudden. You know, we were contacting in the square and then all of a sudden people were screaming and running everywhere. And I grabbed the greenie and then I looked for Elder Young, grabbed him and we ran, you know, to what we thought was um, the opposite direction of where all the action was. And turns out we were just walking straight into it. Um, so we decided to try and get around the main riot by using side streets and such in downtown. At this point, we could smell tear gas and such. I mean, it was it was going crazy. Uh, they were shooting tear gas and, and everything. They had the shields out and whatnot. But we had to get to the metro to get home because we couldn't walk home. And it was like, it was 8 at night and we had to get home before 10 and or 9 and such. And if we didn't have the metro, we would be walking for an hour. Um, so we were trying to get to a metro and we were trying to circumvent this huge riot that was going on. And we were going down this side street. And we were getting to the main street that, that it led out onto. We were just about there. I was in the front of the group. And about four or five guys with bandanas and cloth wrapped around their faces ran around the corner screaming. And they were followed closely by a tear gas canister, right, that blew up right there. And so uh, we, we turned around and we ran as fast as we could, you know, to get away from it. And we ended up having to take refuge at a member's house that lived not too far away. And then getting another member to come pick us up and drive us back home. So that was probably one of the most uh, intense parts of my mission. It happens all the time. They do it for fun sometimes too. But I think that, it, I actually I remember it was, uh, there was a dam being built in a city not too far from Toulouse, in Agen, I think it was, or Albi, I can't remember. But um, they didn't want this dam to be built. And so they protested in the city and the cops ended up shooting a guy, and he died. It was a college student, and they were rioting because of that. And so it, it got all sorts of crazy. Make as many efforts as you can to sound French when you speak French, because the French will make fun of you <laughs> a lot for sounding too American. Yeah, they'll they'll pretend like they don't understand something that you're saying because you're saying it too American, like you know, with an American accent. When they understand full well exactly what you're saying, but they want to put you on the spot for sounding dumb. You know, for sounding like an American speaking French. Um, a lot of the greens that come in, you know, they they might sound something like this when they're introducing themselves. Je m'appelle uh, Elder um, Fletcher. She's American. Uh, je suis uh, content d'être ici. A, a quoi que ce soit. And that's, that's really bad. Don't sound like that. Please don't. Because, no, just don't. The way I would say, the way a French person would say it is, je m'appelle Elder Fletcher. Uh, je suis missionnaire. Uh, je, je suis américain. Je suis content uh, d'être ici avec vous. And that is wonderful. You know, if you, if you go up to a French person and you talk like that, they're going to be impressed. And they're going to ask you where you're from and how you speak such good French and such. They'll be really impressed and they'll be a lot more willing to talk with you. And they won't make as much fun of you. So, you can't speak French like you speak English. You use a different part of your mouth, really. And I'm not too sure how to describe it, but you use, it's a lot more nasal and it's a lot more back here. You know, at the, at the back of the mouth. Whereas in English, we can talk a lot more here at the front of the mouth. The R's are probably the hardest thing that trips everybody up, you know, the H, H. Um, again, it's at the back of the mouth, you use your tongue a lot. My suggestion, if you're trying to really nail that French accent and really get those R's and, and uh, you know, everything in between, is to just watch as many French movies as you can before you go on your mission. And then while you're on your mission, try to mimic as much as you can the French accents that you hear, you know, the, the French people that you, that you talk to. And ask them for tips. French people are more than willing to, to show off. You know, the, the, they're more than willing to give you tips on how to speak better, on, on what grammar principles you should work on. But definitely immerse yourself in the language as much as you possibly can. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. 
I mean, the French people will nail you on them, but don't be afraid of it because who, who cares what they think, <laughs> you know? So, and the Spirit will be there to help you as well. So be sure you're as worthy as possible to get the Spirit's help too, because the Spirit is is there to teach you the things that that I guess people can't teach you very well, like the accent and and grammar principles. That's that's what I found at least with Chinese was you know, if if I had the Spirit with me, it was a lot easier to learn and speak yeah. and and absorb definitely to absorb. Southern France is a lot of country, a lot of vineyards, a lot of orchards, a lot of uh, élevage, cattle raising, I guess, you know, a lot of a lot of that, a lot of uh, agriculture. There you go, agriculture. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so a lot more villages, a lot more smaller cities, um, and it's a lot more peaceful, pastoral, you know. Um, I, I think that that mission is probably the most beautiful mission in the world, really. And the people are chill. They're really laid back. Um, so I think it's different in that way from the Paris mission. Because in, the Paris mission is more urban, I would say. The accent is way different. Way different. In the north, uh, I would compare it to the New York accent here. You know, how, how that's different from the Texas drawl, you know, that you get down south. Or really just the southern way of talking. Um, there's also a different dialect that's spoken. It's uh, Occitan. I think that's what it's called in English, Occitan. But you'll hear it every once in a while. You know, if you get onto the metro, they'll, in Toulouse, they had it um, in the regular French, and then they'd also say it in Occitan as well. So that was pretty interesting. A different dialect, a different accent. Down south, they like to eat duck a lot more. Uh, there's a really wonderful dish. It's probably my favorite dish. Uh, from down south. It's called confit de canard, uh, which is basically slow-cooked duck. It's, it's slow-cooked in its own fat. Um, and the end result is really flavorful, really tender, uh, wonderful, you know, duck dish that you eat with uh, broiled potatoes, I guess. And it's, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. A few different cheeses as well, uh, but every region has its own cheese, you know. So I, I I liked all the food really in southern France. It was absolutely wonderful. There were a few different kingdoms and such in southern France. Like I know Bordeaux used to be its own kingdom, province, principality. It was everything before it was actually a city in France, you know. Toulouse was its own region. Uh, really, it was before France was France. It was just a bunch of different kind of kingdoms and provinces and regions that kind of all spoke around the same language and had kind of the same culture. So, and then became France kind of, <laughs> really. But way back in the day, there were definitely differences. There was one day where it snowed. That's about the most extreme it ever got. It would get really hot every once in a while, but the one day it snowed, nobody was outside, so it was kind of hard because there was nobody to contact. But that's the most extreme weather I've experienced. I tried a lot of liver. Uh, I, I definitely tried all of the weird French food you hear about, escargot, and uh, at one point I even tried some cow brains. So, not bad actually. Escargot depends on how it's cooked. I personally like it fried in butter and such. Um, that's that's the best way to have it. You never have them raw, you know. It's never like that. So, but it's not bad. It's pretty good. Talking to people about anything and everything, you know, learning to expect any turn in the conversation. And then intuition, really. I, I really got to hone my intuition, you know, reading people, how they felt, what, what their problems might be, and such. Etiquette, cultural do's and don'ts, well, when you go to France, and Switzerland even, don't act like an American, I suppose. <laughs> don't act like a tourist. Um, be very respectful, very, very respectful. They're a wonderful people. I love the French people. They're very to the point. They'll call stupid out when they see it. You know, that's the kind of people they are. And I like that. They're more, more philosophical. Um, here in America, we have a lot of math and science and a lot of engineers and such. In France, it's a lot more, there's a lot more emphasis on philosophy and rhetoric and literature and such so the people know how to talk and they know how to um, how to talk to you as well when we would go out contacting 
in France, we would try and make the person as comfortable as possible with us before we actually started talking about anything that had to do with religion or anything deep. Um, once, once you get a French person really comfortable with you and, and on talking terms with you, you can talk to them about pretty much anything. And they won't sugarcoat anything either. They'll tell you exactly what they think about it. You know, if it's religion, they might tell you, yeah, I don't like it. You know, I think that people made it up and that it has caused more grief than good. They'll tell you that. And then it's your job to kind of to bring in the gospel, you know, from our perspective, to bring in the Book of Mormon maybe. Uh, but it's... I love the French people. I, I love them so much. Church was always incredibly interesting because... Um, everybody was themselves at church. Nobody wore masks. They were themselves um, just as much at church as just during their normal lives. They came and and they brought their personalities with them. And that was always really fun. And I admire how the French people work with each other like that. You know, they they work with different personalities almost flawlessly. You know? And if people get offended, they talk about it. They get over it. Either that or there's a huge feud, you know, so I, I, you get the extremes as well. It's either one or the other, but it's that's what makes it interesting. Their culture is very, very rich. They've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of existence. And with that comes a ton of history and a ton of culture. And you can see it just by walking through the cities. I mean, a lot of the buildings that you'll come across in France are older than America, you know. Most of the cathedrals in France are hundreds of years older than America is. The French people really like it when you try to learn as much as you can about their history and their culture. I think that's just as much a part of missionary work as testifying of the gospel and teaching about the gospel. Because you don't want to go to France and be seen as just some American trying to spread his or her cult, you know. Because that's what they think of missionaries a lot of times. You want to be thought of as somebody who's going to France to learn about the culture and the people um, and then who has a message to, sh to share at the same time. One of my favorite things to do was just walk around, you know, go to the open air markets, talk to people, um, ask questions about the culture, visit the museums, walk around the cathedrals. Do that as much as you can if you're going to France on your mission or really anywhere in Europe. Because the more you know the culture and the more you know about the history of the region you're in and the history of the country, the more you'll understand where the people are coming from and why they have, why they think the way they do, you know, why they have these traditions, this way of thinking. Um, you can't separate the work from the people. The two go together. And you have to really emphasize both and work on both and learn more about both. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, Six, sept, huit, neuf, dix, onze, douze, treize, quatorze, quinze, seize, dix-sept, dix-huit, dix-neuf, vingt. My experience was a little bit unique because I um, had an extra couple weeks added on from when the French missionaries came in. So I actually was reported to the mission field by myself. Um, I wasn't with a big group of people um, coming in. So I had my first day, I had a little one-on-one -on -one with the president, with the assistants, and it was just a really small setting in which I learned about um, this is what we do in our mission. These are the standards. Um, these are the goals. And it was really cool to have that one-on-one -on -one time. My trainer was there, the assistants and, and the president, but it wasn't like a big group of people. I really, I really felt the spirit. I felt like my, my mission president um, was inspired and that really good things were, were on the way and really good things were, were going to happen. I liked my trainer pretty much right off. I could tell he was a really, really smart guy. And he had, he had been out for a while. He was near the end when he trained me. And so I was a little bit intimidated by like how much he knew and how much he had been through and how I was, I felt, you know, almost inadequate as a junior companion. You know, he's like a year and a half in and how much can I contribute really? Um, the language wasn't uh, super terrifying for me. Um, I spoke, I spoke French pretty well. And that first couple days, we didn't really cross any Chinese people. So when it came to like the language barrier in the first two days, it was okay. I think in the third, 
third or fourth day, you know, that's when we got sent back to Toulouse where I started. I started speaking to a whole bunch of Chinese people over there. And I felt like it was hard, but the, the, the Lord was helping me, you know, like I'd, I'd pull up a word in my memory that I'd learned like one time or that I'd heard one time in the MTC, you know, and under normal circumstances, like I shouldn't really be able to remember this word, but Heavenly Father, I was always, always praying for help with Chinese and Heavenly Father, um, kind of pluck things out of my deep memory and brought them back when I needed them. Um, it was hard to, to speak Chinese at first, but I always had uh, my trainer, for the first three transfers, I was with my trainer for three. I always had him with me to, to help me out when I stumbled. By the time me and my trainer separated and I was by myself with a French missionary, um, I was pretty comfortable in um, talking to a Chinese investigator or a recent convert because of all the many experiences I had in my first three transfers with my trainer. As I was warned in my interviews with my bishop and state president, like this, like they, they told me pretty straight up, like this will be the hardest thing you ever did in a lot of ways. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, like it's gonna be hard. And then I came out and when it actually did prove to be hard, um, I was like, they were right. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, look, turns out they were right. Um, but it's true that I didn't expect to be blown off like so quickly, I suppose. Like I, what I imagined in my head was like, most of the conversations that we had on the street would be like me stopping someone, us talking for like two or three minutes, and then them deciding, well, that was nice, but no thanks. And then them just like politely saying, not for me. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of what I expected to happen. Um, because my family's French, like I, I kind of know the, the ambiance and um, they're really good people but um, a lot of them have been in the same church forever. And so that's what I expected. And it turns out that my first time street contacting, a lot of them were just like, like right, like they saw us, they knew right away who we were and they were like, no. And I didn't expect, I was kind of like you, I didn't expect that um, to be blown off as quickly as I was. And we did have a lot of really cool experiences talking to people that were really nice and, and really interested. And we taught, we taught a lot at the beginning of my mission, which was, good for me because I, I wouldn't want my first few transfers to be like um, not representative of what my mission would, would be for real. So it was good that I got to teach a lot in my first three transfers because that gave me faith and hope that um, this work really does work and the Lord is is behind it. But contacting, it, it was rough at times. You can sometimes go for hours and not have someone stop, but it's definitely, you can feel the Lord helping you and it's definitely worth all the effort you put in. So the Lyon France mission covers Southern France um, the French speaking so part of Switzerland, and also Corsica, the island of Corsica. The living situations were a little bit different in each of those areas. I never went to Corsica, but I did serve in Switzerland and France. As a Chinese missionary, you can, you can expect to stay in the big cities mostly, and you can expect in those cities to not have a car, and usually not have bikes, but that you will um, be on public transit a lot, um, and that you'll be walking a lot. I don't think I knew of a single missionary companionship that lived at a member's home. It was always we had our own apartments. Sometimes in the bigger cities, in my experience, we had four-man apartments. Um, and some of them, sometimes we had two men. You can expect in big cities to do a lot of walking, be surrounded by large crowds of people, and to be on public transit a lot. And it takes a little bit of getting used to to be able to talk to someone on a metro or a bus about the gospel. That was one of the harder things for me to to get a handle on, but if you're a Chinese missionary, it's just some a reality that you need to, to get used to that when you're on a metro, you might be you might be on the same metro or bus for a half hour and that's a half hour gone that you could have used to talk to people if you don't just kind of muster up that initial courage to talk to someone on public transit who probably doesn't want to talk to you. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, be aware that if you get sent to Switzerland, things are a lot more expensive there. Um, prices are just like crazy in Switzerland because most people have a pretty high income except you missionaries don't have an income so you need to watch your spending a little more in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. There was one area that I served in that had a car. It was the small city of Vitol in southern France and the reason we had a car was because the the city the church building was located in Vitol but the people that would attend that building were from like all the smaller cities surrounding it. Some of them would be an hour or two um, an hour and a half away by car probably. So it wasn't one city that we were that we were um, in charge of it was like 20. And so if we had an investigators if we had investigators and lessons in two different two or three different cities in a day which did happen 
we just kind of needed that car. Um, in Corsica, they also had a car because there's literally one or two companionships and missionaries for the entire island. Um, they actually opened Corsica while I was there before it wasn't um, open to missionary work. To go between cities, like when you're transferred, uh, usually you'll, you'll go by train. Um, there was very few times when I saw when, when uh, missionaries flew, like the zone leaders were flown from Bordeaux to Geneva because that's a really long, obviously a really long trip by train. I never, I never flew except coming into and out of the mission, but as I was there they tried to slowly um, wean the mission out of cars, I think. So more and more um, companionships that used to have cars um, had those not be available anymore and so we're using public transit. And I'm pretty sure now that it's been a year, uh, more than a year since I've been home, that that situation has continued and that there are very few cars in the Lyon mission right now. Obviously, like, you can't, can't pass up the pastries. Like, the, the little um, boulangerie, they call them, um, just have these really awesome pastries and they're not that expensive. So they're a really common kind of stopping point for us missionaries. We get something after a hard day for like 90 cents and it's like delicious. Um, as far as meals go, there's a lot of salads, but they're like more elaborate than the salads over here. They throw kinds of stuff that I wouldn't necessarily think to put in a salad. Um, there'd be, there'd be like eggs mixed with like walnuts and like vinegar and like cranberries all in the same salad. And that's not kind of the kind of thing that, that I would make over here. Um, but I really enjoyed those. Lots of gratin, um, choucroute, those kinds of things that would, that would be cooked in a casserole dish. And Roy's come out really good as well. Uh, a gratin is like, um, it's kind of like a shepherd's pie, but it's got like no, um, it's not usually made with mashed potatoes. It's like um, usually a kind of pasta with meat and vegetables. And then there's that layer of um, grated cheese on top. That's where the gratin comes from is, um, and then they'll cook that to the point where the grated cheese on top will like crisp and then serve it out in little segments. And it's really good. Choucroute is um, cab. It's like, if you translate it literally, it's like cabbage crust. And basically it's like, um, it's like cabbage that's like grated really fine um, and has a special sauce on it. And then it's cooked in the oven. So it's kind of crispy and it's served. We when we had it, it was usually served with sausages, like French saucisson and that was actually really good. It might not sound very good right now, but it was, it was really, really good. It took me a while to get used to, um, breakfast was a bit different. It took me a little bit, a little while to get used to that. Their breakfasts were more um, sweet, I guess. They're used to having like, you know, a baguette maybe dunked in chocolate milk or a pastry or breakfast cereal or yogurt, but usually things that'll be like sweeter. and lunch breakfast that are like savory like like scrambled eggs and like hash browns that's not the kind of thing that they're used to so i had to make that mental switch in my mind um french milk tastes a bit different i didn't like it at first and then it became normal to me but yeah other than that i've i only had really good experiences with french food our experiences were a little different in that she was called french speaking and my whole family speaks french already so she was she received her call a month before i received my call um, she reported a month before I did to the MTC, but we never crossed paths in the MTC because she was only there for three weeks. So it was like she left and a week later I came in. And when I came into the mission field, I think six weeks in we ran into each other at a train station, um, but we never served together until I was, or served in the same district until I was about at my year mark. And it was just, it was just really kind of odd and um, but at the same time, really fun experience to, to serve in the same city as my sister for two transfers. And I was training at the time. I had my first, um, we called them blues in Lyon, uh, my first uh, new missionary that I was training. And she was with a, a missionary that was pretty seasoned. So um, any anytime you're a district leader or a zone leader and, and you have sisters in your district or zone, they're usually the ones who have the best have the best numbers when they come out. I don't really know why. At least in my experience, it was always the sisters. And so... Um, her, she was a, she was a really hard worker, and um, because I was the only Chinese missionary, Chinese speaking missionary at Lyon that was like permanently in Lyon, um, she she became kind of fired up about contacting Chinese people just because she could tell them, oh, my little brother speaks Chinese and he's in Lyon as well, and I'd love to have him come talk to you. Um, all missionaries referred the Chinese um, investigators to to our companionship, but she seemed to do it more, I think because she had that extra connection to the Chinese um, missionaries and was just super excited to talk about it. 
as her district leader, it was always kind of funny when she'd, she'd call me at the end of the week and tell me what her numbers were. And, you know, we'd have kind of this, this uh, back and forth about, you know, how'd your week go? Because I'm, I'm her brother, but I'm also her district leader. So I had to kind of reconcile that in my head, you know, and, and try to find a balance. But um, she'd always, at the end of the phone call, she'd always be like, and I love you. And I was like, I love you too. And then my companion would be like, who are you talking to? But then I had to tell him it was just my sister. It, it was just really funny, you know, like my mission president, um, she asked my mission president before I came in, um, you know, she's like, am I allowed to hug my brother? She wasn't sure if that was in the rules or something. And we were allowed to give each other hugs when we saw each other. And so some, some missionaries would like raise their eyebrows a bit and like, like what's going on? But cause we don't really look the same. Like we don't look related. So, um, it was just, we had some really fun experiences with it. And, um, she, she was a really good example. She worked hard and, um, referred us to, referred a lot of people to us probably more than I referred to her. But she didn't need special treatment. You know what I mean? Like she, it's not like I was like, she's allowed to break the rules because I'm, I'm her brother and I'm just going to let that slide. But cause she's, she was a really obedient missionary. And if she had, if in theory she had been the kind of missionary that would try to break the rules and try to sneak past stuff to district leader, I don't think I would have been more lenient because she was my sister. Probably not. It was really exciting for the whole family just to know that that we'd both be serving there. We both kind of expected to serve in France a little bit because um, we were French citizens, dual citizens. And so it's not, my little brother's also serving France. It's not a big surprise that our whole family seems to get called over there. But because she got called to Lyon, I kind of expected to get called to Paris just because they don't usually mix siblings like that. And um, yeah, we cried a little bit and we, we gave each other hugs, but it was, it was a really cool experience to know that we get to to bond a little bit uh, over our mission experiences in a new kind of way. When I observe the, the Chinese people cooking, they cook a lot of really fresh things. Um, they loved, uh, there's kind of a different family of vegetables that they're actually available in the US, but we don't usually like go to that section of the supermarket and be like, this is where the stuff I want is. And that's the section that they'd go for. I went to a few Chinese um, stores, markets, that they had in the bigger cities and found some some really interesting foods there. When I ate at investigators' houses, we usually, obviously like most Americans have had a dumpling before, but they would like wrap them themselves. And that's the, that's the part that I liked actually, was that they'd make the filling in a big bowl and then they'd take little, little bits of the filling and wrap them in these small little dough circles and kind of pinch the ends of it to make a dumpling. And that's the part that I liked the most was, was making it myself. And um, it definitely was less sweet, I would say, than the American Chinese food that we're used to here, but still really good, really savory. I didn't have any like crazy um, Chinese dishes that were like hard to hard to eat or kind of scary to look at. Um, it was foods that I was kind of used to seeing, if not in person, then like in, in a movie or something, but that I'd never tried before. And it all turned out to be really good. Actually, there was um, one Chinese investigator that had a really cool way of, of like roasting meats where he would add a little tiny bit of Coca-Cola just to like, just to like sweeten it up and give it uh, a tang. Um, I, can't, I can't remember what other kind of sauces he was, but I, but I distinctly remember he had, he had a little bottle of Coca-Cola and he just add like a dash of that um, to his meat. And I'd never seen anyone do that. Like that was French, like that's the only... Um, him and his friends were the only people I saw ever doing that and it turned out to be really good. Like, you know, skeptical about putting soda on meat, but, um, they, they did it really well. She was a student, um, from Beijing. She came, uh, to, to Lyon to study and she went to a, a Catholic private university. So she was a little, she was, had grown a little bit used to instruction, um, from, uh, Christian institution. So it wasn't as surprising to her, um, all the, the doctrine we taught as brand new, I suppose. She had been meeting with the Jehovah's Witnesses for a little while. And um, it was really cool because this was an area that my companion and I had opened by ourselves. Like it wasn't just like two new missionaries, but the, the thing didn't exist before. And now we were opening it. We had no things really to go on, no area book that former missionaries had left behind. And um, so we were really starting from square one and we decided to, that was at least worth a shot on our first day there to go to this 
this big square in the middle of Lyon called Belcour. And um, Belcour Square is, is filled with people and the roads that attach to Belcour Square are filled with stores. And so there's all kinds of people coming and going. And we just talked to, you know, almost every everyone we could, almost everyone we passed. And um, every time, we wouldn't deviate too far from the actual main square. We'd walk down the, the roads with the stores. But we would never deviate too far from the main square. So we just kind of, when we got to a street corner, we might say a little prayer and decide where Heavenly Father wanted us to go. And so we'd, we'd both stop after the prayer and feel like we needed to turn right. So we turn right. And we'd keep talking to people that would blow us off right away and not be interested. And we were beginning to wonder, like several hours of this, we were beginning to wonder, like, are we, are we doing something wrong? Are we, not, are we not guided by the Spirit right now? Because we're taking these turns that the, the Lord is telling us to take and have not bumped into anyone that is that is even remotely interested at all. And so we prayed one last time, you know, we're getting a little bit discouraged. We prayed one last time and we decided to, we were on, the, we were on the, one of the roads. We decided to go back the way we came and cross through the main square kind of diagonally from one corner to another, just one more time. And so we did and we ran into to this Chinese girl who, uh, whom I stopped at. And obviously as a Chinese missionary, like you see a, a Chinese person, you like definitely do not let them go by without talking to you. Um, and so, one thing about being a Chinese missionary is that they love to hear, they love to speak Chinese with you in France because they don't get very many opportunities to do that. So they run into, you know, uh, a guy who looks European who can speak Chinese and they get really excited. So obviously I started talking to her and she, as was to be expected, she got really excited that I could speak Chinese and she was just really, really glad to, to stop and talk to us. And she, um, she had been... Um, walking home from school the, the same way every day for, for several years. But she, she told us later on that she was inspired to take a different way home that day. And looking back, obviously, you know, spiritual hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, you realize that we were guided that whole time and we, and we did run into her um, because we were both inspired to kind of connect at that one point. And so the whole time we had been praying to find someone who's looking for the gospel, you know what I mean? And the... That's the, the kind of the terminology we use, like, Heavenly Father, help us find somebody who's looking. And we asked her if she has any beliefs, kind of expecting her to answer like most Chinese people do and be like, no, no, no beliefs. And um, she did answer in that way, but she was like, no, but I'm looking. And so we were just like, you know, we kind of were like bingo. And that was a light bulb moment for us that Heavenly Father was guiding us the whole time when she said those words, like, I'm looking. We had we set up an appointment. Um, to, to meet with her that Sunday. She showed up right on time. She was very punctual every time. Like she was one of those very rare investigators that is committed and never skipped a lesson. And so that was uh, a good proof for us that she was interested and dedicated. And um, at first she, she didn't believe a, a whole lot of it. In fact, she was quite skeptical about especially the plan of salvation. That was something that was hard for her to get a handle on because it was all invisible, you know, like there's an afterlife, you can't see it. We had a life before this, you can't see it. It's kind of hard for her. Um, but what she, she did like was the commandments. And so we told her, you know, that Heavenly Father, we told her, I think it was in the first lesson, that Heavenly Father has these commandments. And when we live them, we, our lives get better and they improve. And she was like, she was like, tell me about these commandments. And she didn't really want to hear the, the whole uh, plan of salvation, restoration stories just yet. She wanted to hear about the commandments. And so it was ne wasn't necessarily the approach that um, I've that I usually would take to teach an investigator about the commandments right off. But she was interested to learn about that. So we gave her a list of the commandments. Um, we explained them very briefly what they were. And she definitely had a hard time living some of the commandments in her life at that point. And she, deep down, she knew that that was what was making her kind of unhappy and feel emptiness inside. And so every time she'd follow a new commandment, it was it would be really cool to see the light on her face when she would come into a new lesson. You know, she'd be like, her attitude going into it would be like, I'll try. Like, I'm going to do this for two weeks. I'm going to see if my life gets better. If it doesn't, then you missionaries are frauds, basically. And so... We tell her, okay, Liu Jing, you know, like you need to, you need to get rid of coffee. She drank a lot of coffee, and so she, um, she, she took all the coffee she had in her house. She gave it away to her neighbors. She came back the next lesson. She's like, you know, ever since I, I gave up coffee, I just feel so good. I have this great feeling, and I have more, more energy and, and more you know, optimism right now. 
and I can't really explain it, but I feel great. And then we'd be like, okay, you know, like that's what happens when you follow the commandments. And um, now the, the next thing you need to do is start praying every day and, and reading your scriptures. And she'd be like, oh, that does, that's not really going to do anything, but, we, but I'll try it. She was willing to try, always willing to try. And so we, um, she came back to couple lessons later and she's like you know i've been i've been praying like morning and night for a week and i just feel so good like i feel great and you could see that the atonement was was changing her and changing her life she she had a few obstacles to overcome she had a boyfriend at the time that was against the church but and that kind of became her last barrier between her and baptism was that boyfriend and um very much she she just prayed for a way to help her follow the law of chastity and she was very much um, skeptical that the law of chastity was a real commandment and that it would really help her in her life. But right after she prayed, like the next day, that, that she'd be able to follow the law of chastity, her, her boyfriend broke it off um, quite unexpectedly. And that was the first time she saw a real answer to her prayers come, I think. And she, she took that to be a sign from our Heavenly Father and, and so did us missionaries because they definitely, she did not expect it at all for them to, for them to break up like that. But now she, she said basically to us, she's like, she's like, I have no more excuses. You know what I mean? Like I follow these commandments and, and I've been taught by you guys for, it was about six months now. And I feel really good ever since meeting you guys. I feel like my life has improved so much. And now that Heavenly Father has actually answered my prayers and, and spoken to me, I'm starting to believe the rest of this stuff too, that He's actually there and that He loves me and that I'm important to Him. And after that, it was just like a little bit of time to, to fortify that testimony she had. And she was baptized after six months and, and remains active to this day. And she was just a really, really cool um, learning experience for me also. Like... This is what conversion kind of looks like. This is what um, a heart that gets changed looks like because we saw a huge change in her to, in the six months time to, you know, not living barely any commandments to living all of them and how much happier she became and how many more friends she made. It was just a wonderful um, to see that light of, of our Heavenly Father come into her life. There is a bit of a different dynamic when there's two Chinese missionaries together. That's the thing that, that is, I think is important to remember um, that as a Chinese-speaking missionary in Lyon, not all your companions will, will speak a lick of Chinese. Half of mine didn't. So when it was two Chinese missionaries together, I would say it was about 75, and you were in a big city, obviously they only do that in big cities, about 75% Chinese investigators, 25% French. When I was in, I was sent to smaller um, areas, uh, such as Villarban and Yverdon, where there was almost no Chinese people to be found at all. So that obviously brought it up to 100 or 99% French speaking investigators. So I would say that those two dynamics of big city and small area, and also of two Chinese missionaries versus just one Chinese missionary in the companionship would change uh, the, the dynamic. But if you're in a big city, if, this, if the setting's right, you're in a big city and there's two, uh, both of you speak Chinese in the companionship, you can expect to teach like mostly Chinese investigators, like I'd say 75%. And um, if you're in a big city, but only one of you speaks Chinese, I'd say about half of your investigators would be Chinese. And then you just gotta pray for, uh, the Chinese are great. and. and you know, we really love teaching them, so you just got to pray for areas where you can find a lot of them. I think through the members is where we'd find the the most solid and continuous people to teach. The people that we'd meet on our own, I think were more numerous than member referrals that we got, but the member referrals would tend to be taught longer and would tend to last longer. So when it comes to effective finding methods, you know, it, um, we found more people on our own by knocking on doors, by talking to people on the street. But I guess if you want to talk more effective, I think through, through the members is where um, the, the investigators that really pulled through and really were willing to, to make changes, that's where most of them came from. So I'd say it'd be better to have a few investigators that are dedicated than a hundred that are, um, you know, kind of blowing you off. So that's my perspective. They come in knowing what a Mormon lives like, usually, because they have a relationship with this friend who's a church, who's in the church, who's a, who's a member of the ward, and they're not shocked, as shocked, I would say, by the doctrine that you pull out, and uh, when you say, this is the way a Mormon lives their life, they're like, oh yeah, so-and-so does that, and, and I've always looked up to so-and-so, 
So usually um, if they have a, a friend in the church that they look up to, they'll just be a lot more receptive and willing to make changes because there's that light, there's that example that they want to follow. And if you contact someone who has no members of the church in their circle of friends or family, um, you can expect that it's all going to be really new to them and that some of the stuff might be, some of the changes might be, you know, something they're not willing to do just yet because they haven't seen for the, for themselves what kind of happiness and joy it'll bring. Um, I think in my whole two-year mission, um, I taught like a few Chinese people, maybe four or five that were above like 40, that had a real job and were stable. I think I only taught one family, one Chinese family. Um, you can expect when you're going to France that 99% of the Chinese people you cross will be, you know, somewhere in their 20s and will be a foreign exchange student of some kind. And they were um, a really receptive kind of crowd. I feel like um, as far as Chinese culture goes, the older crowd is used to to a society where religion is not, wasn't really tolerated back when they were young. And so they don't think about it very much. But nowadays, China's, um, you know, becoming more and more open to a diverse um, group of religious beliefs in China. They, they haven't opened up their doors all the way, but it's it's slowly happening. And so the younger crowd is okay with the idea of learning about religion and aren't afraid to go home after they do learn about religion um, because of that opening up that's happening right now. And so they were, were more receptive than those who were almost, I would say the older crowd was almost conditioned to fear religion a little bit. The younger crowd wasn't. So um, they were just really curious, even if it was just on an intellectual level. Like Christianity was something we never talked about back home. Um, but now that I'm in France, I see cathedrals everywhere. Like now that this sparked kind of a curiosity in me, so I'm going to listen to these, this pair of what they, you know, what they seem to think are just regular Christians and hear about um, the the Christian faith. And they can't really distinguish, you know, between the different branches of Christianity at first. So they, you know, for all, for all they know, we could be Catholics, but they're still interested to, to hear. And then the more we teach them and the more interested they are, they are really a unique group of people to teach. Um, I think that the idea that revelation comes through the Holy Ghost is the hardest thing for them to grasp. One of the hardest things for them to grasp. They expect us to fill them with knowledge, like a teacher would at school. And once you've learned about it intellectually, um, once you've got the nuts and bolts of the Mormon church, then you're free to go and, and there's nothing more we can do for you. But um, the fact that change um, comes when they have a a spiritual moment with the Holy Ghost, the fact that Heavenly Father can change their hearts, um, the fact that we can't teach them everything, but they do need to learn through the Holy Ghost, is a hard thing for, for them to grasp. There's this invisible force that, you know, will, will inspire you and touch your heart, and it's, it's difficult. Totally foreign concept. Um, something that would help would be to use a lot of real-life analogies and comparisons, like um, comparing our our journey in mortality to um, to something like a test or, or a class, you know, and this is using examples that they can understand and also um, just really teaching with simplicity is something that the Chinese need or else they're not, they're not going to get it. You can't approach them the same way as someone who, who has been Catholic for a long time or someone who grew up in Europe. Some things that we would say really commonly as a missionary and getting through the day. Um, bonjour is hello. So that's a good way to greet people. You can say salut if you're being colloquial. So that's hey, what's up? Um, ça va is how are you? But you can actually carry on a conversation just by saying ça va. Um, I can ask you how you are, ça va? And you can respond to me saying ça va. I'm doing okay. And then you can ask me back how I'm doing, and I can answer the same way. And so, interestingly, you can ask me how I'm doing, and depending on how I say it, um, I could be not very well. So you could say, how are you? And I'd say, uh, ça va. And I'd say, oh, it must not be very good. So that's a really helpful word. <laughs> um, 
I mean, as a missionary, we would always say, nous sommes missionnaires uh, pour l'Église de Jésus-Christ. Uh, nous parlons de Jésus-Christ et uh, nous partageons un message, un message qui peut changer uh, votre vie. Um, just introducing yourself, saying we're from, uh, we're here to talk about Jesus Christ, and we, we have a message that will really help you. Um, we would often ask questions. The way we would approach missionary work in my mission, at least for m most of my mission, is we would say, would you like to talk about Jesus Christ? If people didn't want to talk about Jesus Christ, well, we didn't think they were ready for the message that we had. Um, maybe they, because if they were ready, they'd say, well, maybe not now, maybe later. Or we would ask them questions. What would it mean for you to, um, you know, to know that your life has a purpose after? Um, what does it mean that uh, you could be with your family forever? What would it mean to um, know that God has spoken to us now, um, that the Bible isn't the last word that God has given us? Um, and we would ask them to reflect so that they had a reason that they would want to meet with us. Because a lot of people, um, I think this is in every mission, a lot of people kind of try to force or trick um, investigators into meeting with them. Um, and uh, that's not how Jesus, I, I don't think that's how Jesus worked, and um, I don't think that's how we should work. I know I was like that at the beginning. I didn't know how to do um, much else other than to say, can we meet with you please? Like, we have this and that and this, and kind of, I felt like I had a responsibility to make sure that they were saying no to me, because their salvation was on the line. So oftentimes I would try to make them say no to me, just to be sure so that I wouldn't have their blood on my hands, or however you want to phrase that. But later in my mission, I kind of understood that people communicate, and body language is such a big thing about communication, and I wasn't there to force them. I needed to be ardent, and I needed to be vigorous, and... Mm, but I needed to not be overwhelming or overbearing in the way that I presented the gospel. Um, and I think the biggest thing for that is testimony and, and the Spirit, um, asking reflective questions. Just like Joseph Smith had his experience. He, he had a question, and he went searching, and he asked the Lord, and he got an answer. And so we tried to give them a question so that they would seek with us, um, and so that they would get answers to their questions with us, um, so that they would know why our message could help them instead of us cramming down a message in their throat. Um, sorry, that wasn't more uh, French things that we would say, but we would do all these things in French. Um, merci, uh, au revoir. Um, comment est-ce qu'on peut vous aider aujourd'hui? That's a big one. You know, how can we help you today? We would always offer, even if people said, no, I'm not interested, we'd say, well, can we do anything to help you? Uh, we're here to serve. We came all the way from the United States to do this, to help people in any way. There's a lot of things we can do. You know, ask the missionaries, they can help you. Um, but, you know, we there were some things as missionaries, we weren't allowed to hold babies or children. We weren't allowed to babysit. Um, we weren't allowed to be with women alone, so we had to take take that into account when we were offering to help people. But oftentimes we would try to get out of the city and do yard work for members or for other people that needed it. Um, and that was always a lot of fun to do. A big thing for me, at least with French, is learning uh, pronunciation. Um, if you don't learn to pronounce your words correctly, people won't understand you. They'll misunderstand you. They won't be sure. Um, for example, once we, when we were going, we'd say, Nous avons un message de Dieu, which is we have a message of, about God, or from God. And if you don't pronounce that correctly, like what I just did, I didn't pronounce it really correctly, or I didn't enunciate, people will think, you have a, a, a massage from, from God. And they're very particular about that, but if you enunciate, if you practice, really paying attention about learning the pronunciation rules, um, that will make a big difference in your teaching and in 
not having to worry about understanding or being understood. Um, in French, people talk quickly, but like I said, they're very clear. So in English, we tend to be really lazy with our mouth. You can kind of say anything you want, but you don't have to move very much. And in France, it's a very um, active language. So your tongue is particular, your lips, how you form um, words and things like that. Um, practice is, of course, the hugest, the biggest thing. Getting out and speaking all the time, trying. My trainer said that um, for him, one of the most important things in learning the language was listening, especially at the beginning of your mission, even when you don't think that it'll do any good. My first few days, I would be at a dinner appointment and I would listen for a little bit and I would try to follow conversations and then I would zone out and I would look around and just kind of hear these things. And he said, you need to just not zone out, just keep trying to pay attention. And um, that was a big help for me. In France, they don't have air conditioning as often in, in uh, their homes. So they'll usually kind of manage their blinds and with, you know, the sun rising and setting to um, control the climate in their house, either opening or closing windows, um, letting in sunlight or not. Um, uh, not as many people have computers, uh, so they'll go to internet cafes to use computers. Um, they don't have washing machines as often or dishwashers. I don't think we ever had a dishwasher on my mission. Um, only a few apartments of mine had washing machines, so we would, oh sorry, only a few apartments had dryers. So we would always wash our clothing and then we had to air dry it. They had little racks that you'd hang your clothing on. And a lot of French people do that as well. They have, hang, you know, they'll hang it outside their window like you kind of see in movies. Um, a lot of people, they will have their gardens out their window hanging on a little ledge or whatever that they set up. and Because they don't, they're all in these big apartment complexes and they don't have garden spaces. Um, they'll usually do grocery shopping it's kind of changing to be more like the U.S. They used to do it every day, but now they're more, um, it's becoming less of a regular thing, but they'll usually go and pick up fresh bread each day. Um, everybody will go to their butcher shop or their bread shop. Um, they have pharmacies everywhere you go. So here it's kind of hard. You have to look for a pharmacy. Um, in France, they have pharmacies on every street, every corner. They have hair cutteries everywhere. And so it's just part of their life that you're out and about. In the U.S., it's kind of like we do our thing, we go to work, we come home, and then we set up social gatherings. But in France, it's kind of like everywhere you do go, everything you do is social. Um, and you see people and you get to know them. Um, everybody, well, so many people take public transportation. It's cheaper in France. They don't usually buy phone plans. Um, they'll buy phones and then they'll pay by the minute or by the hour or whatever. So say I bought 30 minutes or I bought five hours for the week. And so it's kind of, they don't have like a monthly plan that they pay for. Um, Yeah, they don't work as much. Um, they get a lot more holidays. I think it's like 35 hour work weeks, not 40. I, I think they might do 40, but they definitely get a lot more holidays um, than we do and a lot more days off of work than we do, that they celebrate and that they do. Um, in school, kids go to school longer. They go from like I think eight or nine in the morning until five in the afternoon, in the evening. And um, they do get, at least in some places that I went, I think it was all over France, they get a half day on like Wednesdays where they end at like 12. Um, and so they just have like a different sort of view on, on how to school as well. I know that in school you're expected to never talk. You sit and you listen. Um, people, when they would learn English, it was a lot more writing oriented, not speaking oriented. So a lot of French people are very good at writing. 
um, a lot, a very good at understanding, but that they have trouble speaking. But most French people know to, how to speak at least a little bit of English. Um, they also love American music, and so everywhere you go, you'll hear American songs. They would have their a few famous French people that that you would hear the music there of the day, but you know in America you never hear French songs. There's maybe one or two that people. There's a few nowadays that Americans see and they understand, or that they they look up and they hear about. But in France, American music is huge. So those are the only big things about culture and lifestyle, um, vacations and holidays that I can think of. So I started in a town called Angoulême. And uh, there, it would rain pretty often. It wasn't too bad. And um, that's in the, the, that was in the northwestern part of my mission. It was the highest mi city in the mission when I started. Um, later, I was transferred to Nice and uh, the east of the mission and there were some that were closer to this ocean and some that were closer to central France. Um, the higher up we were at, it, at, the winters were cold. In Nice it was sunny all the time because it was right by Italy along the ocean. Um, and then Toulouse it was... it's kinda like Angulum. It was rainy relatively normal. I felt like it had varying climates. It was never too hot or too cold, except for in a few areas of my mission where it got pretty cold in the winters. But I can't really complain. It went down to zero, negative two degrees Celsius once. And I know people, you know, farther north had it worse. And so it snowed a few times in my mission and it was never a big problem. I never had to wear snow boots. So we'd just go out in my shoes and go to work yeah i don't know about all of france but i know that among the members they would always celebrate thanksgiving with us that's not a french holiday because it's about america <laughs> and the pioneers and stuff or the pilgrims and stuff um but they they really enjoyed celebrating that with us and for us um christmas is a big thing they'll spend all day cooking and eating um in our mission, our president said you can go to members' houses, you can stay there, you know, longer than a normal visit. And so um, it was kind of expected that you'd be there for three or four hours at a member's house on Christmas Day. And uh, they would, you know, cook up a meal for you and have everybody over. And they, one Christmas that I had, actually it was my only Christmas there with the way my mission lined up. Um, they had like non-alcoholic alcohol. It was, and so that was interesting that they had these, these drinks and, um, they would celebrate like that. And they, uh, a lot of it is still about family and things like that. They have a holiday. I don't know. I don't remember what, when it is. It's the near, I think they already had it this year. So it's like January or February. It might be in March, called King's Day. Um, I don't remember why they celebrate it, but everybody does, and they all get cakes, and you put a little figurine in the cake, and you cut it up, and everybody's eating their cake. And uh, when somebody finds that they have the figurine, they are the king or queen of the day, or of the week, or whatever. So they get special privileges, and it's kind of like you won the, the party. Yeah. Um, I can't really tell you more about why that happens. I, I learned about it a long time ago, and so I don't remember. They would celebrate that. Um, they like St. Patrick's Day, so they would celebrate that. Um, a lot of people like to drink, so that was a, a good excuse for them. France started out, um, it wasn't known as France. There were, the, um, there were those, the prehistoric man. You know, they have a lot of cave paintings and... Um, you know, sites like that. There are things called menhirs and, um, oh, I can't remember what the other one is called. They have pretty much these stone uh, catacombs or uh, burial sites, uh, other things that are landmarks, and these are prehistoric. And um, with time, there were people that moved in. Um, there were the Gauls, and so they were 
attacked and kind of conquered by Rome. And uh, the famous Gaul leader was named Vercingetorix. And so he was kind of obstinate, even though he was defeated by Julius Caesar. And um, the Gauls were pretty strong people. They were good agricultural people. They were be they believed in in a god, or, or at least in gods. Um, they actually assimilated very well with Rome. They liked a lot of the things that Rome offered them. Um, there was only like one or two rebellions during the time that they were, you know, conquered. Um, with time, um, they were able to establish a national language, which didn't exist forever. Um, a lot of the countries they had kind of divided up, but they were re reunited under Charlemagne, uh, Charles the Great, I think. Uh, and from then on, you know, these there were kings that passed down the rule through Louis XIV and, and to today. Um, but a lot of what we know about France now, it comes from Louis XIV. So he's the one that kind of helped with ballet or, um, you know, with a lot of the food and the cultural superiority that you kind of think of when you see France. I guess you just stay in the good neighborhoods and you're safe. Um, there tend to be more dangerous neighborhoods than, um, at least than my experience in the U.S. I could go anywhere all over Provo and I'd be safe or I'd feel safe here. But in France, if I'm in a town, I know that there's at least one area that's kind of not safe. Or at least not safe at night. So, um, there's kind of the center center of the town in every town. And there's a an old town. So it's Centreville and Vieilleville. Um, and those places are usually pretty safe no matter where you're at. As long as you're with your companion and you're keeping the rules and... Um, being a, a good person. Um, usually, you know, there are a lot of homeless people, but like I said, they, they're just having a hard time. So you can be nice to them, you can talk to them, and I think that they have a right to the gospel just like anyone else. So I would oftentimes give them a Book of Mormon or um, a website card or whatever. And a lot of people will ask for money, and you just have to say, no, I don't have um, money that I can give you. Um, but I have something else that I can help you with. Um, and a lot of the homeless people, um, they want to be homeless. They can get by doing that. They can make a lot of money that way. So I was never against buying food and giving it to them. We had investigators or, or I don't know if we ever had members of the church. Uh, maybe, yeah, some converts and investigators that had um, financial difficulties, and, and oftentimes we had a lot of extra food, surprisingly, and so we would give them canned foods or pastas or things like that. Um, there are some areas that they're called, uh, it's the HLM in the Bonneu, and it's kind of usually right outside of the Centervilles or the center of town, that there are these areas where they have very high, it's kind of like apartment complexes, very tall apartment buildings, very condensed. So you'd have like 13 floors and five rooms per floor, and then you'd have seven buildings like this. And um, oftentimes you'd have a lot of poor people, uh, immigrants, blacks, uh, Arabs, uh, poor French people, Romanians, gypsies, that would live in these areas and uh, we would do a lot of daytime work in in areas like that because it was easy to go door to door and a lot of people they would be religious if you had you know Romanians that are Christian or um, a lot of Africans that would come to, to France um, from a lot of different countries they would be Christian um, you also have Muslims as well um, and so our chances we felt were pretty high of getting into people's homes homes to teach and um, that's true, but um, when it became nighttime, it could be dangerous. You'd have a lot of, um, most in our experience, um, with me and my companions, a lot of the 
the danger was actually a lot of um, Arabic uh, youth that would be out at night and um, they would kind of, you know, pick on people like us. They didn't like the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses very much. So they would think that we were them and they would kind of call out to us and um, you'd just say, hey, you know, we got to go, but it's good to see you. And you didn't really have trouble like that very often, but sometimes you'd have interesting discussions about what they believe and what we believe. And, um, you know, what I always say is people who are relig living their religions, they're, they're good people. Uh, they, they tend to be good people. Um, because religion doesn't teach us to be mean in general. It doesn't teach us to persecute others. And again, I think a lot of people when they lash out or when they're angry or when they're close to religion, it's because they, um, they're they scared. So I, I've had run-ins with people uh, that were mean, that were rude. Um, there were times walking home at night that, you know, people would throw stuff at us, but we didn't, like, see where from. Or um, even as we were walking around town, people would throw, like, little pebbles or whatever, um, like little kids that were making mischief. But I think that you could get that anywhere. Um, and there were, you know, there were times in my mission, uh, cars would get vandalized. You know, if you left a Book of Mormon in your in the front seat of the car, there were times that, you know, the people would slash the tires and break the windows. And um, if once when I was with my companion, we were in one of these Ashalem areas with these big apartment complexes and it was nighttime and we were just going to visit a member, a convert, and his family. Um, not his, his family weren't members, but his daughter was going to get baptized. And she ended up getting baptized, so that's really cool. But uh, um, he lived in this neighborhood that wasn't a good neighborhood, especially at night for missionaries. So we parked our car and my companion said, you know, I don't feel good about this. And so we called up our our friend and we canceled our meeting and uh, we said we'll need to come back another time but we just we can't make it this isn't gonna work out and it's and then it probably our car probably would have gotten trashed we parked in this area that there weren't very many cars and there were 20 or so um, you know Arab kids hanging around kind of just hanging you know loitering and so he it was kind of not good signs. We had been able to kind of hide our car among other cars or get out of our car really quickly so people didn't know that it was the missionaries in the past, but um, this time we felt like we should leave. And so I think that the Spirit um, really tells you it's the guide. Is this a dangerous moment? Should I be here or not? Um, there are some areas in that are, are blocked off. At least we have maps in our apartments and certain areas were red areas and we were not allowed to go into those areas unless we had an appointment. Then we go in and we get out. And uh, that was the way, that was the way you did it. You would go to appointments, you would avoid red areas and you'd listen to the spirit. Um, there were a few times, I can think of one in particular at least, that um, the spirit said, you need to leave right now. And so we left. And, um, you know, I definitely know that the Lord takes care of his servants. I'm not saying bad things don't happen. There were car accidents from who knows what. And um, you hear about missionaries who pass away on their missions for whatever reason. But um, God keeps his promises and he does protect us. And he has work for us to do. And uh, I, I believe that and I know that that's true. Uh if something happens, I know that there's a reason for it, so. They always eat baguettes with every meal, pretty much. And um, that's pretty much the best, best bread you can eat, so. They have a lot of different types and stuff, but. Um, in my mission, a lot of the French people, they, they love lasagna. So they'll have that a lot of the time. They have a meal called tartiflette. Um, that's... It's like a casserole dish where you put potatoes, cheese, milk, bacon. Um, you kind of cook it. And the milk, it doesn't like evaporate out, but it kind of thickens or whatever. And, it, um, and so you eat that. And that was a big dish where I was at. They would have endive salads all the time. Um, mustard dressings are popular. So that's not something you see in the U.S., but they'll mix mustard with vinaigrette and things like that.
Um, one of my wards had a member who was German, or he had German roots, and so he would make us, you know, sausages and sauerkraut, and um, we had, you know, crepes, of course. People say crepe, but it's a crepe. So that's just a little pronunciation thing going on there. Um, and they'll they'll have um, savory and sweet crepes. Um, usually they'll put Nutella on them. If it's just quick, you can do powdered sugar with butter. Uh, you can do lemon juice and powdered sugar, sugar and butter. Um, the savory crepes are my favorite. Uh, you can do it. They'll usually put an egg actually with theirs. That's not something we think of. We'd think of that as an omelet, but they'll just crack it on the crepe as it's cooking. Um, and so it's not like you cook it separate or whatever. I mean, so it'll be kind of runny, almost like a raw egg. You can do with ham, and uh, there's a cheese called Emmental. It's kind of like Swiss cheese, but they, they use Emmental with their crepes a lot. You can do with eggplant, um, spinach, feta, tomatoes. And so all these things mixed in with this is really nice. Um, they have, often with their savory crepes, they'll have a um, there's a flower, sarazen flower. It's like a brown flower that's kind of hard to find here in the U.S. And that makes it, that gives it a different texture and a different flavor that's really, really good. Um, let's see. As a missionary, because we didn't have as much money, we had a decent amount per transfer, but um, I wasn't a big spender. We would just buy baguettes every day coming home from wherever we were at because they have bakeries every corner. We'd buy some cheese, we'd buy fresh fruits and vegetables, pasta, rice, frozen um, meats, um, and frozen vegetables. And so that way we could have for dinner pasta and veggies. Um, breakfast we would have, um, there's a thing called pan au chocolat, which is like, um, it's like a croissant with a bittersweet chocolate cream, mm, chocolate paste more like in the inside and it's a uh, one of the best things we'd have like one of those every day and uh, you'd have hot chocolate of course you know you dip your baguette in that and you could eat it but for lunch my favorite was just having baguette with cheese you know they have hundreds and hundreds of cheeses um, they say that France the, the problem with France is that they have one religion and 300 cheeses and America has 300 religions and one cheese and so I, I, that is reflective of the, the culture, you know. Um, they really do have so many different cheeses and every region has their specialty and a lot of them do taste kind of similar but the, the method of preparation is different. Um, some people like leaving their cheeses to get old so they're smelly and they, I mean, I love it. I love the, the, all of them. They're all so different and delicious and, um, they don't always taste like they smell. So that's something to remember because a lot of people, they smell French cheese and they think, oh, it's yucky. It's not all as smelly as you think. And it can be, but it usually tastes pretty good. So, um, I've had a boar soup. Um, I had horse frog legs, escargot, um, they, you know, they, they'll have, they'll have these things, but not too often. It's not like a, as much of a, I didn't have the impression that it was as much of a delicacy as you think of. They would have caviar as a delicacy. That is something that it really is kind of hard to come by unless you buy the low quality caviar. Usually you'll put that on some bread with butter. Um, and you'll eat that. So in case you ever get caviar, um, and it was, you know, it's kind of salty. It just tastes like seafood. It, it wasn't that great, but again, I didn't ever have the fancy expensive caviar. Um, the other thing that's famous for in France is pate. So foie gras, um, that is a huge specialty of France. And a lot of the time it's illegal here in the U S I don't think you can bring it back to the U.S. I know that a few places here, they make a pate, but it's not usually the same. 
uh, type. So what they do is they force feed uh, ducks or geese and then when they die they'll take the liver that has been you know engorged and, and fattened up and they kind of grind it up with other meats or other things fat and they they prepare it with some other spices or flavorings and they put it in a jar kind of like a preservative or like a like a is that what it preservatives kind of like canned foods so you can keep it and it'll stay good forever but and they'll open it up and it's especially famous during Christmas time um, and that was one of my favorite things. You'd eat that and you just put it on bread and it was really yummy. A lot of people don't like the idea of eating duck liver or whatever, but it was really good. And, um, they have really expensive and really cheap versions of it. You can also get foreign foods. Um, when I was on my mission, we would look for Reese's cups and you could find that. You could find Dr. Pepper in stores. Um, you could find Vegemite, which is you know, British or, or Australian, typically. Um, a lot of Asian foods you could find there as well in the supermarkets. And so they they have a lot of different things. The problem for me was coming back from my mission, I didn't know what to eat or how to grocery shop because I was so used to just buying fresh vegetables and fruits, um, buying bread and cheese and just eating, not having to cook very often. We would cook sometimes, but not too often. I just didn't know what to do when I came home, so that was kind of interesting. I think the last thing that, that's really big in France um, are actually French fries and beef patties. Um, normal people will eat them all the time, so you buy them in packs of four patties, and they'll just cook them and eat them. They won't put them on buns necessarily or anything like that. They'll just season their beef patty. And... Um, French fries everywhere. A lot of French people, they'll buy a five pound bag of frozen potato chip, like potato fry things. And then they'll throw them in a deep fryer and make fries and eat them. So that, I guess it's ironic that they're called French fries because they, you know, they don't, they don't call them French fries, but we do. And they eat them a lot. So in my opinion, they have a stronger sense of a separation between church and state. So, um, you'd go around and, and talk to a lot of people and they would be very sensitive to that. If you were on buses trying to talk to people, sometimes you would be asked to not talk to people about God or about religion. They'd say, well, this is a, I don't know the word in English, a laic. Laic? Is it laic? Is that an English word? Um, just meaning that it's, it is like a neutral area. It implies that you're not supposed to talk about religion of any kind or, or discuss that. And our, in our mission, our presidents, depending on the mission president, said, well, if they ask you to stop, you stop. You can remind them, well, actually, I do have the right to talk about this, but I'll respect you just to respect the people, the drivers, and, and things like that of the bus. Um, we weren't supposed to proselyte near other churches and things like that, but... Um, um, people will love to talk to you, uh, in France about anything, um, about all their problems and about how hard life is. They'll open up and tell you anything pretty much. Um, but the moment you bring up God, a lot of people will shut right off and they'll, they'll kind of back off. Um, I think a lot of the anti-religion sentiment that, I don't think that it's, all over France. I don't think that's a fair stereotype, but a lot that that you do see um, comes from the French rebellion um, when they had their independence, that they didn't like the Catholic Church anymore, and they were really against um, a lot of the things that the Catholic Church had been doing. And that's all that they knew was this sort of oppression. And um, so people now, they, they're either, a lot of people are either uh, strong Catholic believing families. They tend to be the older parents. Um, uh, they might be another religion, you know, another Christian religion denomination, or uh, they'll be, you know, atheist. Um, and of course, you have your mixture of um, Islam and um, Jewish populations in there. And Islam is a very large religion in France because they have so many immigrants from the Middle East and from North Africa. But um, 
just a lot of the Christian population there they're dissatisfied with with the religion you know that they have and in my experience um, people the reason that it comes across so angry a lot of the time in France is that people are scared they're upset they're mad at God um, a lot of people ask well if God was really here Oh, why are there so many starving children or so many people on the streets? And in France, you really see that. There are homeless people everywhere you go. Just everywhere. And so many people that smoke. And it's just that people, they, they have hard lives. And uh, they need the gospel. But a lot of people, they're a little bit prideful. And uh, they're a little bit bitter. And so I don't think I would say that France is that different than other missions. I think other people might say that, but I think that every area of the world has their own problems, and um, France has that. You know, maybe if you think of Provo, people know everything about the church already. They've already been talked about or talked to about the church, so f for that reason, they they might be closed off. But in France, it's it's a different reason, and um, I I honestly believe that you know. Our faith is what helps get the results of, of missionary work. People have agency, and we can't deny that, but um, God gives us miracles, and He prepares people, and I know that that's true. Some sites that you can visit um, that are worth it. Um, I honestly, I've been to the north and the south of France, and Paris is nice. It's good to see. The uh, Eiffel Tower is good. The Ark of Triumph. Um, there's a, the Mont Saint-Michel, which is farther north in, in uh, France. The English Channel's nice if you want to go swim there. It's kind of freezing water, but it's a good site to go see the D-Day beaches. Um, but I prefer the south to the north. The people tend to be nicer. The weather's a lot nicer. Um, there are, at least in my experience, there were a lot more towns that were newer. So in Paris, it's an older architecture, dirtier town, um, bigger, more crowded. But in Nice, for example, it's a big town, but it's new. It's clean. It's very modern. It's um, tourist friendly. Um, and they have good food. It's, it, in, in Nice, they have the Italian influence. And so a lot of the architecture there resembles Italy. And um, the food has that sort of influence as well. But it's really good. In France, they have this, they, they feel like the state, the government, has a responsibility to take care of them. So you have universal health care, and for that reason, a lot of people don't work. They find an excuse not to work or to just kind of get money from the government. Um, but they they have it hard because there's so many people that are receiving funds from the government um, you know you have to make a lot of money to pay 50 percent taxes you know and to have a good living and a good life um, but the people they like I said they're open they don't pretend that problems don't exist I, I've had that experience in some places that I've lived where people act like life is okay, that they put on this face. But in France, people are open. They're, um, they're honest, and uh, that's, that's a really good quality.